Um, okay, so all right, so let's begin. Uh, so this is book club number eight. Um, so welcome everybody to the book club. Very redundant way to start this. Um, and today's book we're going to be covering is Susan Napier's uh, updated ed edition of her very famous book, actually, anime from Akira to Hao's Moving Castle. And so with me today, I have is Brian. Hello. Uh, Roger. Hi. And, uh, and Digi. Hey. All right. So general, okay, so let's sort of get into exactly why I ended up so why this particular book? So it was originally published in around 2001, and it's actually a very important book in a lot of ways because it's really sort of the initial bedrock in terms of how we can understand um, anime analysis as it sort of germinated in Western scholarship today. Because prior to Napier's book, there really wasn't too much in terms of monographs that were really written about anime as a whole, I would say. Um, I mean, like we had that in manga, you know, you go to like Frederick Schott's 1996 book, um, which uh, I believe was, uh, oh my God, I'm blanking out. Um, the 1996 book by Frederick Schott, it's not manga, manga, the world of Japanese comics. It was... Dreamland Japan. I actually own that. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, Dreamland Japan, yeah. Uh, so, and now a lot of people are probably going to say, well, you know, there have been things written before Napier's book that came out in 2001. You know, there have been be things before that in the West. You know, Helen McCarthy, for instance, has written about that. Um, and Allison, for instance, has also written in 1996 about mother-son plots. Uh, and that's that's fair, but I think in terms of sort of a, a a cohesive singular text, really, when we're looking at that from that parameter, the most notable one that often gets cited is anime from Akira to Hao's Moving Castle. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why, because this is sort of a a smorgasbord of ideas as it is presented through a lot of different lenses. And I think Napier sort of flexibly moves through a lot of them. And I wouldn't say it's necessarily too much of a deep dive into it, but it does give you a good idea of how sort of particular thoughts might, might, might function in a particular way. Um, when we talk to Brian Rue, for instance, uh, Brian, you might remember this, but when we talk to Brian Rue, he he specifically cited anime from Akira Tahao's Moving Castle as being sort of the introductory text to um, Western scholarship analysis on anime. And I think if we can make the comparison between sort of levels of sort of bedrock texts... Um, Anime from Akira to Hao's Moving Castle is a very sort of undergraduate piece. It's a, something you would recommend to an undergraduate class in some ways, whereas something like Thomas Lamar's The Anime Machine is something you would un, you would sort of recommend to a to a graduate sort of class. Now that said, that said, of course, a lot of people are probably going to disagree with me on these claims, and that's fair. Um, but that said, let's get into the basics here. What do you guys think of this book? I feel like we should have read this eight months ago. <laughs> uh, I know we talked about this off, offline, you know, well, online, but off, off recording. Uh, yeah, this is, it's very dense, very heavy, but it's very much a product. Like you can tell that it was written prior to a lot of trends in modern anime and culture, but it's at that time when these trends are developing and becoming apparent and She's also a very legitimate American scholar. I, uh, she, I did, she taught at Harvard. And as you said with Brian Rue, she, she's very influential. So, and with the anime machine, I, I concur. We probably should have flipped the order that we read these books in. Uh, no changing that now, right? But, uh, I thought it was excellent. It, uh, I understand the criticism it receives. Uh, some of it is valid, some of it is invalid. But at the same, Sorry. Wow, the beautiful <laughs> New York sound. Uh, so crisp in the morning. <laughs> but at the same time, we are all coming from a perspective of we are already ingrained in this culture. 
and she is not coming from that perspective. But it is fascinating how much she does like anime now. If you look at her work since this, it, and you hear the story, fuck, someone else talk. I don't hear the story. I just hear the sweet sounds of New York. <laughs> My like when you hear the story of how she like got into anime and and her fascination with it since since 1995, it's really interesting and fascinating. Well, she come she she came from literature. So she's coming from a literature perspective, which I think is sort of a very interesting way to come about this because a lot of people going into anime sort of have a little bit more of a, a lot of them come from sort of fandom. A lot of them come from animation studies. I believe uh, Terry Silvio uh, came from animation studies. Thomas Lamar is kind of a outlier because he he came from biology or something, I believe. Yeah, um, but I feel like the best books we've read on the cultural studies of anime in Japan have been from people who like are not fans who are laymen to an extent. And you can kind of see as they study the phenomenon medium, whatever we want to talk about, they do gain an appreciation, even if they're being hypercritical or overly critical uh, as Napier is in some of her works, but you can also see that she does have a, a, a very positive outlook on a lot of anime even though she's very critical of a lot of elements of it does that make sense yeah actually there's one part of the book that early that's really striking of this is when she's discussing Rurouni kenshin and she says that it's an empowerment fantasy but she also makes it very clear that she claims it to be a work that's worthwhile discuss in discuss in discussing as well as saying that she believes it to be a good work in spite of that Honestly, I didn't find this book to be very critical at all, like in terms of like uh, the worst it would say is maybe that there are problematic ideas in a story. But even as she's describing a like a hardcore tentacle rape porn scene, she will describe it as like beautifully animated and highly inventive and extremely memorable. You know, like she gives a lot of credit to uh, to even shows that I'm sure. I would watch and go, well, this is fucking dog shit, you know, like. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, I do want to clarify, like, when I say she was being critical, I mean, like, in the fact that she was, like, bringing a critical eye to these things, not that she was being negatively critical. Right. Uh, But a lot of the criticism. That's that's what I mean, that, like, if you if you're looking at it that that way, I think I think she does a great job of, like, I don't know either just loving anime or covering her tracks extremely well if she actually was bothered by any of it, you know? Well, like, it's very I, I, clinical and and, and, and often cele- celebratory. Mm-hmm. Like, she never... When she's describing something that many would describe with derision or disgust, she instead just uh, describes it, you know? Like, there's, there's never the sense of, like, ugh, I can't believe I had to watch this to write this book, you know? I never got I, that feeling, which I have gotten yeah. from other people. And I think that that speaks to how how well she is able to convey her thoughts and ideas and how good of an actual cultural critic she is. Uh, as most of us are used to dealing with not as academic level of criticism. So she approaches it from a very authoritative position of a lifetime of study on how to be a cultural critic. Right. And most of us are yeah. not used it to that. It was refreshing we to for, hot for me as, as someone who mostly, people being, yeah, as you're saying, sees hot takes and reactions and, you know, I watch YouTube analysis and shit. Like, uh, yeah, it was interesting just because I feel like most people would expect an outsider to the culture to be down on it and to be more reactionary. And she's not at all. Well, I think there's a very good... Th- I think there's a very good distinction that you're going for here, Digi, which is that there is this distinction between critique as we understand this sort of the idea of taking a text and then sort of measuring it in a particular way through perhaps some sort of formal or contextual lens. And then there's the sort of what we might consider to be sort of a textual analysis under a, a bracket of critical because a lot of I think a lot of lay analysis and I don't know if you would agree with me or not, but a lot of lay Certainly analysis anything that's falls called a firmly into the form into, into the idea that, of so. critiquing a show. Um yeah. yeah. I mean yeah, I mean there's plenty of people who are who are trying to do stuff more like this, but it's it's rare it's rare, like on somewhere on YouTube, even if someone was trying to do an in depth analysis, they're most likely going to let slip in 
their opinions of it, you know? Um, and uh, she did not do that. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating because, you know, she's talking about a lot of these shows where there are these moments where you can see that she's casting some sort of aspersion on them in some ways because, you know, she uses terms like horrific tentacle rape and right. and um but even in those cases i don't even think she's describing that as like you know it doesn't come across like she's saying it's horrific as in i was horrified like or like it's 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 a horrific thing to be like the intentions of the film are for these scenes to be horrific it's literally horror you know mm -hmm. like it comes across as like yeah it's a horrific tentacle rape scene because that's what they're going for and that's what is intended you know it doesn't it, it never felt like she was accusing to me that the these things of being something uh you know bad that they're not supposed to be i i guess growing up i didn't realize that wicked city was technically porn i because it's like i, I just thought it, it was is, like this super actually. dark and gritty yeah but she god damn my fucking brooklyn uh <laughs> featuring our fifth guest brooklyn <laughs> <laughs> um Roger, do you want to get into your general thoughts? Because I feel like I'm going to start talking and not stop if I get into it. <laughs> okay. Um, my general thoughts on this book was I found it extremely fascinating, and I love how it continues on this theme at the beginning of the book, at least uh, the Princess Mononoke version. I originally had read the old one, and then I switched over to the new one a bit later on into reading. But she discusses... Once again, much like Anime, A Critical Introduction by Raina Dennison, she discusses anime as a transnational identity, and she does this by bringing up this idea that because anime characters, they don't necessarily look Japanese, but at the same time, they don't necessarily look Western. They look anime. Yeah. They are their own identity, which I found that particularly interesting, and it's something she also used uh, Mamoru Oshii's quotes in regards to that. And I found that topic in particular to be rather interesting. I I was I I was uh struck by that simply because, um you know she doesn't dive too very deeply into it, but uh, anime YouTuber Nino had just recently made a video "Are Anime Characters White?" where he explains why, like in almost the exact same terms, the way that uh you know anime characters are abstracted and they look like anime characters as opposed to any particular nationality and i just thought it was it i was like huh yeah this was already clarified 15 years ago but because none of us read um uh, here on youtube we, <laughs> we haven't had a chance to expand on these ideas till now what book did we just go over this in where they're talking about the uh it was the last book we just did right where the characters are are westernized wasn't it the last book so one of the most recent books we just talked about this most uh, recent book um I, I mean, remember. it they, might they be. Blend together now. <laughs> I don't recall like previous books. Um, I don't recall previous books directly talking about Mukokusuki, which is the 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 term that she talks oh, about. Oh, she was the you know, like she, I, she was the first time it was ever stated that that was the word. But I, I believe we like the last book got on that during the C chapter, right? It was the last book. It might have been. If we're talking about something happening at sea, then that might have been Robot Ghosts and Wired Dreams. It was It was that book. Because that's the book that it also got into borrowed words and everything. Yes. Uh, Roger well, Identity did. is... Sorry. Identity is one of the biggest parts of this book. Like, it, yeah. it does talk about body Kind of, it's almost festival. all about identity. Like, that's... Yeah. It's really about, like, the identity politics of anime, kind of. Yeah. And Japan. Definitely, yeah. And every chapter discusses identity in some form and its relation to what the specific work is about and how it relates to the real world. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, okay. we're going to get into it, so like, it's, I don't yeah. know where to go from here, because we'll, like, eat... Well, I'm, I'm just waiting for everybody else to do their impressions before I give mine. <laughs> I don't know if Roger was done yet. Book was good. Oh. Book was good. Read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another interesting aspect I'd like to bring up, if you don't mind, is um, when she discusses Giver, Bubblegum Crash, and uh, Evangelion, and she brings up this idea of um, these consumerist ideals and how, even though this technology is quite possibly harmful and it's presented in this way that can be viewed as harmful, um, the only way to stop this tyrannical technology is with that same technology. So there's another layer of conflict to it. Well, I guess I'll give mine then. Um, 
I found this book very deeply frustrating. And the more of it I read, the more frustrated I got. And uh, I, I'm tempted to say that I hate it. But... <laughs> <laughs> and the the reason I say this and like I don't want to I don't want to like make it out like this is a bad book because this where it, the for the time it comes from it's definitely impressive. Like I'm thinking back to what anime discourse was that I was looking at in in 2004, you know, when I when I first saw stuff on the internet, there's nothing close to this. I'm impressed that she actually has seen a lot of anime and is able to cite you know enough enough sources but this book is a clusterfuck and um it just it goes in a about a million directions and ultimately the conclusion it draws is anime is too big to be put in a bubble and there's nothing you can really say that's about all anime so really it's more of just a string of small analysis that she's doing on just a bunch of different anime that she's seen like Essentially, it's here's what thoughts I had about each anime I saw that were interesting. Here's how some of those, you know, some of the ones I saw were connected to each other. And, um, you know, and and there it is. But you kind of have this sense, like, you could have, this book could have gone on forever if she just watched a couple more anime, you know, like every show she could have watched would have its own unique things that she could have brought up in the same kind of context or changed the definitions of the things she was talking about. And so it felt like just all these, these micro tangents of, of ideas that don't ultimately end up leading to something that broad of an understanding of anime, because as soon as you go beyond these shows, it's just going to keep expanding. It's more like a starter kit. Like, here's a few ideas to get you started thinking about anime. And for me, having seen most of the shows that she talked about, uh, like, a lot of the times, if I had seen the show, which was most of the time, um, what she was saying just felt like it was literally the text of the show like or the obvious subtext you know that like i didn't feel like i was learning something new about that show or seeing it from a new angle maybe just because i've had these shows forever you know they're all old as hell most of them are i watched as a kid so i understand the subtext kind of implicitly but like you know i'd be sitting there reading about inuyasha and i'm like yeah i know i watched the show you don't gotta tell me this um but then i thought well i guess you know not everyone has uh, it was more interesting when i read about like video girl i which i haven't seen and i was like okay and the thing is i don't disagree with anything she says about any of the shows like i completely agree with her her takes on each show with the exception of evangelion um but like the conclusions she draws about anime based on those things are where she loses me um and this is most prominent for instance in the the chapter on pornography where she just talks about four she talks about four pornographic ovas um and well really three and then she throws in cutie honey just cuz it's kind of similar to the subject she's talking about but then she keeps saying like you know well this is what it, pornographic anime generally is it's like this and i'm like well no that's what those four are generally like and as soon as you step outside of that there's a whole there's a whole different world of it you know and uh it just i feel like there's you know even though she keeps reiterating this idea that yeah there's too much to anime to put it in a box you know this is just a this is just a beginner's guide kind of thing i worry that you could read that section and think well now i get anime pornography and it's like this is just like one small subgenre of the category you know even at the time um even in 2001 or whenever so yeah um that's my sort of broad sweeping issue with it was just the sense of not feeling like it was really building a big image of anime it was just a bunch of random ideas about about specific shows you know uh yeah like the, the most of the criticism this book gets is the generalizations that she does make uh, prior to recording, I was reading, and she is writing about the trends at the time, and this was right. a lot well, of, like, specifically and- the porn trends, I think, started in 1995, when she first was introduced, and I'm a little older than you, and growing up, the big porn in the United States from anime, The Blue Girl, right. and... Like Cutie Honey was thrown in there, like it was like, and it gets yeah, it was up, very know. popular. And the tentacle porn thing was like 
a trope that was thrown on anime unjustly. But then, but it's it's like this is the blockbuster anime though that we're covering, like the like the stuff sold at blockbuster. You know, like yeah, exactly. Like I, I mean, I can't blame her for having that perspective if it's if she's only watching the stuff that's been brought to the U.S. at the time, and maybe there wasn't even access to other stuff at the time because it's the nineties. Um, it was very limited, right? Very limited, at the but time. like, and I don't even disagree with any of the things she's saying. I just. It's just this idea of it's a it's a corner of it, you know, like it's a corner of the thing that she's talking about, as opposed to like like everything she says about the porn she's talking about. I'm like, yeah, that's that's yeah, there's a whole genre of that. And you're exactly right in how you're describing it. But then I'm just like, but I know a hundred other shows you know, that are that are different. And I felt this way about like each different category she would tackle. And the one that really baffled me like i'm talking about the porn one because that one was particularly closed off where she only talked about like those four that that one genre but the one that kind of baffled me was when she talked about mecca because that was the one where she really did start to make like these these kind of weird generalizations about what mecca is and repeatedly kind of like sweeps gundam under the rug in this weird way where she just kind of goes like yeah there's there's stuff like gundam like the typical mecca shows uh, but look at this one, Evangelion. It's a total deconstruction because the main character doesn't want to get in the robot. And I'm like, that's literally the plot of Gundam. You know, like, I had this this overwhelming sensation that she had heard about Gundam and not seen it, you know? And, like, it, it's it's just this, like, kind of frustrating missing link. There's just, like, little moments of factual inaccuracies in there. And, again, this is all stuff that, I don't know, it's the it's 2001. You know, she, like, she says, Kunihiku I- Kinohiko Ikuhara, who brought us Sailor Moon, and I'm like, well, hold on, you know, there's just little things like that that make me go, if we, if you were a little bit deeper, then it, this would hold up better, you know, and maybe well, it's just a consequence of the time. Sometimes it's that actually, they actually address that in the book. Well, one of the particular times is when they updated it, because initially they were talking about how Miyazaki doesn't really set any of his anime in modern Japan, and then. Right. What happens? Spirited Away comes out, and it's set in yeah. modern Japan. And then they address that in the new chapter. But you are right in that um, sometimes, like with Gundam in particular, they had the Rombo Rawl story arc, wherein that's Amaro trying to essentially escape yeah. from getting in the robot. I mean, um, the first, the one of the most famous, you know, scenes from early in the film after the first battle. Amuro refuses to get in the robot, and Bright slaps the shit out of him twice. Uh, and my own father never even hit me. It's like, you know, that was the that was like the conceit of Gundam is that it's a war story, and being in a robot sucks, and nobody wants to do it. So this idea that Evangelion is subverting what like she paints it as though like all other mecha are about power, like just empowerment fantasies. Everyone wants to be in the robot. Everyone wants to fight. It's about a crescendo of violence, and I'm like. Gundam was war as hell. That's the plot of the show, is that piloting the robots suck. By the end, the robots are completely disempowered. You've got, you know, the RX-78 with its head missing and its leg missing, stumbling through an asteroid, and they don't- the final battle's not even in robots. They fight on feet with swords, you know, and then even that falls through. And, like, you know, I just don't think Gundam is necessarily a celebration of violence, though obviously it uses violence to have fun when it wants to but i mean then you get into zeta gundam and it's like just fucking brutal and nihilistic and everyone dies and it's horrifying and uh and i'm just thinking you know it's not that what she's saying about these particular mecha shows is wrong but to paint them as like counter to what is typical of the genre it's like evangelion is firmly entrenched in the tradition of real robot you know drama like it's it's it it's a tomino inspired kind of thing you know so to kind of like well, not well, address gundam made me think Ideon. like yeah Ideon, Which gundam is... and uh you know anything tomino else worked. tomino was doing then yeah well much like guns germs and steel sick reference um if you get down to the nitty-gritty specifics there are major problems with this book. It's kind of like the meta themes that are the most important aspects. Right. That she uses minor specific examples to prop up. So you are correct in some... You are actually not in in some sense. You are just flat out correct that she's generalizing and wrong 
on some of the general comparisons she makes. Right. But she is correct with her her critique of Evangelion if she even if she's not entirely correct of what Gundam was like. Right. Well, but she also was talking about spaceship Yamato and it's it's once again this like historical context of what popular anime was. Right. She probably did not have a massive familiarity with Gundam. Right. Or at least the very dark grim Gundam that was essentially the springboard that created Evangelion. Yeah. Uh with some very similar themes and plot points. So I completely agree. It's but just, if we if we get bogged down in the specifics all day, uh right. it'll it'll well, it, I, I this conversation will just happen over and over. The again. thing is that it it kind of to me it ends up poisoning some of the bigger ideas just because of the fact that I can find you like, okay, her, her main conceit uh, or her, her first big one that she brings up is that anime is sort of uh, has three different, what's the word she uses? Uh, modes. Um, yep. Yeah. The, the, the uh, elegiac. I don't know if that's how you pronounce that word. Uh, the elegiac, the um, apocalyptic and the festival. And, uh, and she kind of slots all the shows that she talks about into these three forms. And as I was reading along with it, I kept thinking, like, surely not every anime can slip into these three or else they are just way too broad. Like, how broad are we going to consider the idea of the apocalypse or the festival? Like, like, you know... In order to slot all anime into just these three things, like all of them have to be at least one, and oftentimes she cites that they are multiple, I'm thinking like, what's the usefulness of these three categories if they're that broad, you know? I'm not sure she was the one who invented those terms for anime. No, I she think did. Like, oh, she did. Yeah, she the celebration out. of festival is hot, is like cited a lot, so maybe her creation of the festival theme is one that's often regurgitated so uh, the, um, the festival comes up in multiple books we've discussed yeah the the three the three modes are actually the biggest problem i have with this book um even as this book as it was uh republished in 2005 particularly because i i i i i, I echo digi's concerns which is that they're the terms, the modes themselves are incredibly broad. Right. Um, and Napier has, in a later interview, gone on to confidently state that nobody has has built up a sufficient counter argument to the use of those modes. And oh. I thought, well, that's. I mean, I'm I'm looking around my room right now, trying to find the best one I could come up with. And like the first thing I that I think is uh, F a tale of memories. I'm thinking about that show and like. I can't think of how it would fall into any of those three. Like, I don't think it represents the, the attitude of a, like the festival. Um, it's not, it's not laid back enough or like, or like Mono no Aware enough to be elegic. It's not apocalyptic at all. And I'm just thinking like, you'd have to really stretch. Like you could maybe call it a festival if you really wanted to make that definition as broad as fucking possible, but I don't see how it fits into any of those three categories, you know? Well, I, all... I just... Wait, I just realized that we never really went over what the three modes were, or like their definitions for the audience. Yeah, go Can ahead. do that, Joe? All right, sure. Yeah, because so... we're, like, we're, talk- we're having this heavy conversation of like, wait, the audience maybe they hadn't read the book. <laughs> so there are essentially sort of... So there are about roughly two layers to the concepts as they're depicted. And Napier is essentially trying to go for very specific things with these with these terms. The first one, um, the carnival, or as she would call it, the, the festival, the Matsuri, um, she's drawing upon the works of Mikhail Bakhtin and Bakhtin's work on the carnivalesque. And the whole idea of the carnival is the, um, it's essentially, so in medieval in medieval literature, particularly Bakhtin was working on the work of Rabelais, the carnival itself was supposed to be the space in which, you know, as we understand, you know, medieval society, it's very, it's very structured, it's very hierarchical. 
But the carnival is this instance where everything sort of collapses in on itself. It's this space where everybody is quote unquote fair game and it's all, it's dirty, it's destructive, it's an equalization in this specific instance. And that's sort of where new ideas can come in. They come in through the carnival. And you can actually see it in something like, say, um, Stand up comedy. Stand up comedy is actually a very modern instance of a carnival. The idea that the comedian can criticize or make jokes about any particular thing and that sort of injects a new idea. And she's saying that the carnival for, um, or the festival in this instance for anime sort of has that particular sort of transgressive nature to it. And, you know, this is actually a fair, this is actually a fair, um, idea because, you know, if you look at the work yeah. of someone like, say, Sawaragi Noi, who said who's been def who initially defended sort of quote unquote Japanese low art like anime and manga against sort of the the haughty traditional Japanese high arts um it's very it's very open it's very sort of porous and allows yeah. new ideas to come in um I, I and I actually like the this festival idea as applied to anime because I mean the main show she kind of uses to explore it is Ranma one half and like it I totally get it, like just immediately, because that is a show that's about just sort of everyone is like a wacky character who just kind of breaks everything. You know, yes. they're, they're all about breaking conventions or social norms or just running rampant, breaking reality. You know, just like it's it's almost like a farce, except that it's taking itself seriously internally in terms of its story, you know, but like mm -hmm. it's not. It's not the real world. It's a real world where everyone can do whatever they want, you know? Um, and and that's pretty fundamentally different from how most people understand Japanese society. It's not a place where everyone's running around doing whatever they want and being wacky, colorful, green-haired uh, party girls, you know? So, yeah, I like the idea of it. I just don't like that it's so broadly encompassing, you know? I think I think of her three... The festival one is the one that is very rings very true for a lot. Yeah. Um, as someone points out, I think the one way you can look at them is that they're they are broad intentionally so, and that there is a spectrum of 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 what level of anime falls for in. sure. So you are like, yeah, not every anime can fall into this. Just like not every movie falls into categories of action horror, and there's a lot, especially modern time, like recently. In, re in the last 10 years, there's a lot of gender, or not gender, uh, genre. genre bending, gender yeah. bending. That's, that's the book for you. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, genre bending or like deconstructions of genres that are becoming very popular that are yeah. intentionally trying to break conventional ideologies and thoughts about our media. Yeah. Uh, and so. I think that she puts these out there as for the layman, this is a very easy way to categorize anime. Right. Not all anime. Or just to get I, it. I'm to, not trying to defend like, her, but like, like particularly I think that that with this intention. one, I think what's what's really helpful about that about that term and about how she defines it is that it's a real easy way for when someone goes like someone looks at an anime and goes like, Why is it like this? You can, you know, hit them yeah. with this Well, there's this concept of the Matsuri and you know, you can like uh mansplain at them for a bit <laughs> a mansplain <laughs> i like and, and i think that that gets to the, who the audience for this book is and the audience for this book is not anime fans it is yeah, students definitely. academics or novices at best and because we are so engrossed in the culture most some of us more than others looking at you Digi, uh yeah. <laughs> like you have a different perspective yeah, and I mean, and, again, I I am impressed by how much she does know. And but a, a, another thing that's weird about it to me, like in thinking of it as being for laymen, is that it is so chaotic and jumps around so much. Like just the structure of the book, that like I could see academics being able to keep up with it because this is what you guys read. But um, like you know, I'm trying to imagine giving this to like my dad to try to explain <laughs> anime and he'd just be like i don't i don't understand what the hell this woman's talking about you know like well by layman's i mean like <laughs> academic don't know layman's. what anime is yeah in in college people who are studying culture academically yeah. layman uh there are better books for layman layman's and i'm pretty sure we've gone over it at some point i have to look but this is for this is for like cultural students 
uh, which is, I think, what a lot of the reviews said that they were issued this book in college for their cultural studies class. Uh, it's also interesting how many, how many people had no idea what this book was when they bought it, and then they were very shocked when they got it. Yeah, that's uh, the, well, that's that's the funny, funny, funny thing, because I guess because it's famous in the academic world – uh it's you know this i bought this on amazon it had amazon reviews with like one star that are like complaining about the word feminism appears in it like you know people who didn't know what the hell they were getting themselves into at all <laughs> yeah that that's really funny yeah it wasn't the it. top amazon review complaining about how gender is like applied to all these shows yeah yeah which i mean she uh, does lean on that quite a bit and it's i was i was kind of in I don't, I mean, not, I'm not saying it's bad, but it's interesting that she, like, chooses to continually, like, through every section of the book, to, like, gender the shows. Um, and I, sometimes I wasn't entirely sure why, but. So to briefly address that, a lot of the, part of the reason why is because she's working on a lot of the, if you look at the scholars she cites, um, particularly folks like Sharon Kinsella, um, Sherilyn Orba, um, Mari, uh, Kotani Mari um, and Allison, a lot of them have a lot of have done a lot of work in feminist fields, and so right. that's where she's drawing a lot of her influences from, and that's why there's a lot of sort of injection of feminist literature. But also, in a particular way, if you if you're looking at it from the perspective of when she probably penned this, so 2001 to 2005, a lot of the material that came out about anime sort of in the late 90s, early 2000s aren't very feminist in perspective. I mean, this is sort of the publication of uh, works like um, works like Saito Tamaki's Beautiful Fighting Girl, uh, Azuma Hiroki's Otaku Japan's Database Animals. Like, these are specific ideas that don't really have a particular feminist lens. In some ways, if you're looking at it, if you're looking at it from the perspective of, of a of someone who is much more familiar with feminist theory, you know, some of these works that are coming out of Japan might seem in some, in, in some ways to be sort of uh, trying to hide any particular sort of feminine perspective, to yeah. use that word, because it's, you know, Azuma Hiroki is essentially saying in Otaku Japan's database animals that the database essentially gives viewers a sort of a, a quote unquote, quasi deterministic way of 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 getting out of the uh, out of the gaze and Saito Tamaki because he's a Lacanian and he's talking about virtual sexualities well for a feminist particularly uh, a feminist scholar like say perhaps I'm not saying that she's exactly a feminist scholar but for someone who's familiar with sort of the Mulvavian you know the Mulvavian gaze like um like Napier is you know the works that are coming out might itself be very challenging if not problematic you know you have tamaki whose work in beautiful fighting girl essentially says well you know there's not there's nothing necessarily wrong because there's the there's the real world sexuality and there's the virtual sexuality and the virtual sexuality what happens there means it doesn't necessarily happen in the real world and so there's no problem because there's this distinction that is made well for right. someone who is studying sort of who has studied a lot of second wave feminism in the west for someone like for like Napier, she might look at this argument and say, well, hold on, there's a huge gap here. And that's why she might sort of front load a lot of feminist ideas, a lot of feminine theory, yeah. um, because there's a gap. For for what it's worth, I don't so much mean that she loads lots and lots of feminist theory in there. Just the, per I mean, I don't know if this is just a an aspect of feminist theory. I haven't read any, but um, just the fact that she just specifically describes shows like in terms of genders like not necessarily to like say anything about it like 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 in terms of it being positive or negative or like um but like she'll just like like literally like say this show like is is like um is like male in some way like she will classify a show as being like a feminine show like she classifies ghost in the shell as being like overall feminine in this way and uh yeah it was just I, I don't know. Maybe that's just a part of feminist theory that I don't know much about. But it was interesting that she kept bringing that kind of stuff up, often almost apropos of nothing. At least it seemed that way to me. Like, I kept wondering, like, is that important to the point you're making right now? <laughs> you know, um, I mean, it's interesting. 
uh, it was just kind of strange to see her doing that all the time throughout the book. Well, occasionally she does apply that and say, look at these works, and what these works came out at this time period, and they're essentially, she's applying the reflection of gender roles in those works to gender roles of Japan at that time. Like when she talks about Urusei Yatsura, Oh My Goddess, and Video Girl I, she describes how, you know, Urusei Yatsura has involvement of the mother in it, whereas Video Girl I and Oh My Goddess, she describes as from the era of the divorced mother and sort of comparing and contrasting the two time periods in which both, well, in the case of that one, those two works versus Urusei Yatsura when they came out. Yeah. I, and yeah, in the case I, of Kiki's Delivery Service, she brings up sort of how the role of the woman may have changed versus when the book came out and when the movie came out. Right. Yeah, I think I agree with Roger on that, that, that she's very much looking through a lens of history. Uh, but it is also important to note that she grew up during second wave feminism. So was and I don't and I wouldn't say that she is a scholar of feminism, but uh, she's not exactly unaware of it, and much of anime, and a lot of the critique of anime has been very uh, muted on those subjects, avoiding it to some extent. So right. it's important that I think she's just making the important distinction that hey, these are things. Some of them don't sit well. Some of them right. sit very well. We I mean, again, I don't. Up. I don't even really think she brings up that much whether or not it sits well. Like most of it's very just descriptive, and yeah. not not exactly judgmental. And again, yeah, I, I don't, don't think she's. I don't disagree sorry. with any of her readings, but it was it was just interesting because of the fact that she's choosing to, like, let's say she's in a chapter about, uh, you know, something else. And uh, like like about Mecca and then, you know, continues to bring up the genders, uh, like the genderings of the shows, even when it's not necessarily the, the the central topic. And the reason that interested me is because there's she only, you know, talks so much about each show individually. Like she's kind of viewing it from one particular uh, lens and it's sort of whatever. That's why I said at the beginning that I feel like she was looking at it, whatever interested her about it. You know, whatever she caught out of this movie, because none of these are thorough analysis. You know, none of this is like I'm talking about everything that this has to say. She's very much like picking a topic, um, often one that she can string three shows together with, you know. So, yeah. like, let's say, uh, yeah, like, what am I going to talk about in Ghost in the Shell? Well, the parts of it that relate to this other show, you know, um, as opposed to like a comprehensive analysis of all the different things that Ghost in the Shell has to say. So that's why it interests me that like it, it always sort of came back to this one lens, which maybe is just the one that interested her the most or that she thought there was the most unique things to say about. As you said, if there wasn't a lot of feminist writing about these about anime at the time, that might have just been the most interesting perspective to take to it. Um, you know, it just feels odd because this book is called Anime from Akira to Howl's Moving Castle and because it tries to be this like broad spectrum, like here's here's a big picture of anime but it's really like like one person's kind of like through line of interest through the anime she watches you know it's like what did she pick up on and find interesting about these shows when you could write uh, 10 more books about all these shows and all the different things that they go into and you know i mean no, some definitely. of the shows have had books written about them you know as you said, like Gundam, someone mentioned earlier, Gundam could have fucking forty books written about it. Yeah, uh, and I don't think she sat down to try to do that. I think it just gets back to what the themes of the book were, which were identity, and in identity is gender identity. Right. And as you said, it was most interesting to her, so she kept coming back. But see, I wish, I wish that this book was like anime and identity. Like, just that. Like, just strip away this pretense of it being, like, uh, a broad introduction to anime and just write a book about how anime hi handles identity, since that's, like, the vast majority of the book anyways. Um, you know, like... It's I don't think she obfuscates the fact that that's not what this book is going to be about. I think very clearly in the beginning she lays out that this book is going to be about identity festival and... Uh, 
like the looking at it through the cultural lens that she's going to give. Um, well, based upon how she titles her artic- her journal articles and based upon how she titles her chapters, I wonder if the title of this book was recommended by her editor. Yeah, I was also about to say that I don't think she titled this book. <laughs> I well, really I, don't. I, I, when I, when you first told me what book we'd be reading this month, because I'd never heard of it, um, I thought Akira to Howl's Moving Castle. What are these? What are these like landmark? Like this is this is a very odd time frame, you know. Like we're starting in 1988 and we're going up to 2004. Of course, that's when the book is written. And the original was Princess Mononoke, so 97. Um. So like, I just had thought it was such an odd time, and every time I like showed somebody the book or or told them what it was called, they were like, "Why those? Why those two? Um, and I think that's very indicative of like the nature of the book because the reason she starts from Akira is that that was her first anime, you know, and that's why again I feel like it's this through line through her experience with anime because you know she's not starting from the beginning; she's starting from her beginning. Uh, and and bouncing all over the timeline from there, you know, Udase Yatsura is older than Akira and she and Yamato and other stuff she talks about. So it's not like this really starts from Akira, but it's like, yeah, the title kind of is it's weird. It's a weird name. <laughs> Anime from Akira to Hell's Ruby Castle. It, like, it's you, especially you weird at- to me because the last chapter of um of the book isn't on Princess Mononoke. No. Or, or uh, when you get to the house movie castle part, it's slotted right into the middle of the book, like just it's so short. So, too. It, yeah, it just <laughs> yeah, it just pops in, and it's like, hey, by the way, uh, it's two thousand four now, and uh, house moving castle came out in Wolf's Reign. You know, uh, and, then she's, have, and then she's gone. I, I have to say uh, though, it's interesting. Bebop. It's interesting because um, I had actually when I was reading that chapter, I've I had forgot that she was going to be talking about Howl's Moving Castle, so I thought she was ending it on Hibane Renme. And then when yeah. I saw, oh, by the way, Howl's Moving Castle, uh, that part came out, came off as a bit awkward to me. Bro, you wanted Howl's Moving Castle? Well, here it is. <laughs> um, I mean, well, I guess so- I, I, it just seems like, you know, pre- like when it was Princess Mononoke, it made sense because at the time that was the highest selling Japanese film of all time. And with the next book, it's just the latest Ghibli film. I think she should have probably just stepped up to Spirited Away and left it at that. And it probably would have made a little bit more sense, you know? Like, just because Howl's Moving Castle didn't turn out to be nearly as big of a deal as uh, Princess Mononoke or Spirited Away was. Or Akira. You make an interesting point. So, that uh, Akira was his first, her first day of May and Howl's was like her last before she wrote this book. Does that mean she sat down and watched like all of the Blue Girl and like all of like she just sat down with like a joint and a notebook and was like I'm gonna watch some hentai now? <laughs> That's definitely the. I mean, like you said, the ones she watched are like you know the blockbuster ones, the ones that like anybody from the '90s who uh, would have seen who was like a big anime person. So yeah, I definitely think she like said okay. I gotta watch some porn to to make my point, you know. Uh, let's head on down to Blockbuster and rent the whatever porns they got, you know. Um, and those were probably just the four that were on the shelf. And she went, "All right, well, you know, the directing's interesting. <laughs> they all have a lot of tentacle rape." I think. But, um, oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it just it runs into a a similar problem to, um, like okay, I have this uh this this big video i did years ago called what is anime and what isn't where i attempted to define the usefulness of the word anime and i was saying that so many people want to start calling shows like avatar the last airbender and stuff like that anime because of a stylistic similarity to anime even though anime doesn't really have one style it has one style if you live in the west though because that's the style that we bring to western tv you know like if you grew up on tsunami and adult swim then you're going to have a very specific idea of what anime is because they only really bring one genre. They bring action shows aimed at young men for the most part. You know, occasionally we get some shoujo on some other channels. um, And even then it's not that, not that particularly different. So similarly, I feel like the problem I have with when she, you know, gets into something like talking about the anime porn is like, 
the reason it was all tentacle rape demon stuff is because that's what was getting brought to America because it was edgy and and violent and it was what you know the uh the young the the late teen early 20 something anime fans of the 90s wanted uh in America because it was exotic and it was something we didn't have at home you know and uh you know as i was reading through that chapter and i just kept thinking like what about what about pop chaser what about you know like these shows that these these hentai that existed in in the 80s that were just like totally different from this and this this but then she couldn't possibly have heard of it you know so it's just it's it's that feeling of in some like i can tell she went as far as she could she tried to see as much anime as possible she definitely consulted a lot of people who had done research on anime who talked about it watched as many shows as she could get her hands on but there just wasn't you know i feel like if 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 i was in this position and I knew that there was a whole world of hentai out there, but I only had access to four shows Then I maybe would say, maybe there's not enough of this for me to comment on it, you know? And that's how I kind of felt with that and the mecha section. Um, just because like the way she talked about mecha, like was so general and I'm thinking, well, mecha wasn't that big in the U S in the nineties. So like she, what did you have? Gundam wing? That's it. Even then that's a pretty moody show. Guys didn't exactly want to pilot the robots in well, that you, either, you but you know. You just said it there, yeah. though. Is like in in the nineties, in nineteen ninety five, like anime was only like four things in the United States: Akira, Ghost in the Shell, Evangelion, and Hentai. It's and just that me. Hentai was tentacle <laughs> Hentai. It's just like, you, you literally that's this, all anime was. <laughs> you can see exactly what the risk was in like trying to write about anime as a whole when you don't have access to it you know and even uh, today we still run into this problem where like i get in trouble sometimes because i can't read japanese and people criticize the things i say about anime because they're like oh well, you didn't read what uh this producer said on a blog last year that uh well, so contradicts like, one sentence so, in your book but it's you know there's always a limit. that's getting into the like there are general so like when you're doing cultural studies and critiques there are levels. There's the macro level and the micro level. The micro level will defeat the macro level just as the macro level can defeat the micro level. Okay. Like, what's some... <laughs> Thanks, Hegel. <laughs> Thank, no problem. Uh, so what some producer said on a blog is not relevant uh, because the author died and we killed him or her. Oh, wow. So... <laughs> yeah, it's actually... But... This actually is interesting that you bring this up because in the Grave of the Fireflies Barefoot Again part of the book... She brings up how Barefoot Gen is more of an anti-war story than Grave of the Fireflies, but Isao Takahata has made a claim multiple times that Grave of the Fireflies isn't an anti-war film at all. So, hmm. it's like, that goes without saying. <laughs> Did you know Saving Private Ryan was supposed to be an anti-war movie, and it's like the greatest war movie of all time? And from your perspective, you're saying that people often throw random bullshit stuff at you to try to tear apart your arguments. And, like, that can always happen because there's always some little minor detail that ignores what the main point is, you know? Right. Like, the main but point it, is the point. It can the minor affect points... it. Like, if, say, um, you know, if if a show is making reference to a cultural idea I don't fully understand, I might not be equipped to you know talk about that sh talk about what that show is really about you know like yeah, maybe i don't point, totally get it at what point is anyone equipped then because in this never in this current... never never well, no one's ever well, equipped so then, fully. should we never ever do any but this critical is the, analysis it, of anything the thing no 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 I, this is why i keep stressing that i think this book is great for being from 2001 it's just a matter of like we have the perspective now that a lot of what's said in this oh now we just do, definitely. doesn't feel like it like it doesn't feel oh, helpful there, like anymore, i agree you know? with you there are definitely like, parts of this book i was hearing, reading I was hearing like, wow, what she has to say about some of these shit. subjects it's uh, like, like i'm not trying we've, to we've gotten way past this we know so much more now you know even about what was out at that time you know like it, it's not even just a matter of like things have changed since this book it's like our perspective on what existed when she wrote this book is different and so it kind of affects when when she says things like you know when she's talking about the changing um nature of like the emergence of the shoujo for instance uh which is a great 
great bit. I love that her her identification of this idea of um, shoujo as like young girls as like something you can just like project onto. Like they're these kind of inoffensive, all lovable. Like you you just you want them in every conceivable way. Like girls want to relate to them, guys want to possess them or to just project onto them. They're just like a blank slate, and they uh, you know they captivate the world. Uh, but she talks a lot about how Miyazaki's um, shoujo characters are are very different. They're a bit more driven. They're a bit more um, like uh, they take more action and stuff like that. And 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 they don't feel like the typical shoujo characters of the time. But I uh I did my own little research project a couple years back where I watched every anime from 1991 just because that was the year I was born and I uh I wanted to do so. And in doing so, I came to this really uh, incredible kind of revelation. I've made a video about this uh, called Women in Anime in 1991 or something like that, which was that like every show from 1991, the main character was a powerful female character, like all of them and all in different ways. It was a spectrum. Some of them were more like the shoujo she's describing and some of them were like not were either, uh, you know, just like powerful women who were nothing like the typical shoujo or who were exactly like a Miyazaki style character, you know, but there was just so much of it. Like every show was about a leading, uh, a leading woman. And so for me, there's like this, this other broader thing that might've been going on, you know, even bigger than what she was talking about. There's more to it. There's this other deeper level we can look on it at, and it might recharacterize even the things she was talking about. And the only reason I'm able to come to that conclusion is because I now have torrents of everything from 1991 and I could do that, you know, um, and she couldn't have at the time. So, you know, is, is this like early stage Moe? Like, I feel like if Moe was a concept when she first read this book, she would have talked about Shoujo briefly and then entered into to Moe during that Moe, chapter. I Mo- think, became a concept in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, so. I, no, I know it did yeah. in Japan, right. not in, not here, not in the West, and specifically not in Susan Napier's academic I mean, West. there's definitely this evolution. I have a video about this, too, the, the history of cute girls in anime, um, where I talk about how... Basically, over time, there's this this weird like it's it's like in the late '80s because in the '80s, anime is all sci-fi and fantasy. It's all like you know masculine escapist fantasy kind of stuff that we all associate with '80s anime. But then in the late '80s and early '90s, suddenly for some reason, all the men just get swapped out with girls, and in some cases, it becomes. You know, it's a cutesy girl who's just in the the male scenario. And in some cases, it's a girl who, like, is just doing what the guy would have done. Just kicking ass and taking names and doing whatever. And it doesn't even feel like uh, a, 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 a Bishoujo character at all, you know? Yeah, and I think that that's the influence that Miyazaki and Moe had on the industry. Um, I'm not going to make the presumption... Uh, you should read, or, or you hopefully have already read the Moe Manifesto. I have read uh, nothing. This is the first book I've oh. ever read in my life. <laughs> Anime from Akira oh, to Hell's Moving Castle is literally my first text document that I've ever perused in I any can't capacity. Tell you're kidding. <laughs> I actually think that uh, Macross is it's a very a, it is actually the first. Um, sorry, it is actually the first um, uh, academic book i've ever read i would highly recommend you pick up Moe manifesto yeah because they actually um, do bring up what i'm going to bring up right now is the idea that macross it was a combination of both the male sensibilities of the uh, the giant robot and the action but it also took the shoujo sensibilities of the romance and sort definitely. of combined the two into a cohesive whole and that's yeah, why a lot of people complain like about it it's like get your shoujo out of my mecca yeah. <laughs> well, that was outright the intention. Kawamori's uh, statement was, "I wanted to write a love story on the backdrop of epic battles." And that's the and she, that's what the show. She was. gets to that in this book, by the way. She talks about how like emotions start seeping, uh, feminine emotions start seeping into predominantly what was traditionally a masculine genre. Right, and that's what, like one of the whole chapters is talking about how like. There is a lot of women shit going on in Evangelion. It's like a lot of people dealing with emotions and problems, yeah. which were traditionally not in male anime at the time. 
you are correct. But that's, that but it, that's was, the thing. it was in there, but yeah, that's like, the thing. I just feel like there was a lot more of it than Eva was ninety five. You know, Gundam yeah, was seventy nine, like, and they were Eva dealing broke with the, the industry. Emotions, you know, it broke the industry. Like everything since Evangelion is like, in some sense, an Evangelion clone. In some sense, borrowing damaged character, all this stuff. Much in the same way that SAO changed a lot of the industry too, not necessarily for the good, uh, as we all know about you. So, but like Rogers, I think Rogers is correct. Um, a lot of this is fr- like sh- when you talk about Shoujo and Moe, it's just it's like this whole other thing that she didn't get to get to in this book, unfortunately, because she didn't really well, know I'm, it existed. Here, I want to give you an example of exactly more what I'm referring to. Like, there's this yeah. there's this 1991 uh, two episode OVA called Soul Bianca. It's about uh like five women on a spaceship uh who are like bounty hunters or something like that or they're space pirates. And even though like they are whoa, who just unplugged their headphones. <laughs> uh even though they are like uh you know, attractive women um and 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 all that like they're almost never sexualized. They're always sort of in control and in power. And there is dialogue in the series that is very clearly feminist messages. Like there's like there's a not discreet subtext about them like taking out the male leader of this planet and like saying like us girls do what we want, you know, like and the whole thing never once has a moment where it feels like this is all just for guys, you know, like I never felt that way watching it, which I did for a lot of the shows from then. And maybe it was, I mean, it's a hard sci-fi, uh, you know, space story with a bunch of beautiful girls on a spaceship, but watching it, it was kind of like, this isn't Moe. This isn't, this isn't just be shoujo. This is like just women who kick ass, you know? And it was, it was such a different feeling. And a lot of the stuff from that time period kind of gave me that feeling, you know, and uh and that's why i feel like there's this other strand that was also going on that like if we're missing out on it then it recolors the whole perception of the time period it's like maybe maybe there was an, an even bigger and, and and maybe it was lost like i feel like when i was watching those shows from 91 i was like what happened to these girls like why did we end up why did it become more moe why did the girls become like less and less of this kind of kick-ass and more of this like controllable like the the girl is always the most powerful in the story except other than the main character which is what it all is now you know like what happened to this era when it seemed like everyone wanted to write a show about a a girl who kicks everybody's ass and is in control, you know? I mean, this is coming from someone who does not like a lot of modern anime. I also have a longing for the past because I feel like anime has painted itself into a box. Um, a moe box. <laughs> Double pun there. Uh, huh. um, but it's it's all about the touchstones and the cultural... Temple mon like the monument animes that have changed, and those are the ones like those are the ones worth looking into and investigating. So like Miyazaki, Sailor Moon, Dragon Ball Z, like these tentpole animes that you can I, peg down. I I, I like I understand and I kind of I, I don't presume what you're gonna say, but like when you look at these great one off shows that were never massively popular, but they have a huge you you like them. There's a huge fandom. I'm not discrediting them. There's a reason that we look to Evangelion, these big shows, as moments I, in the thing is, anime I, I worry about doing that because those shows are often outliers. Yeah, but it's I, I completely agree, and it's not us doing it; it's culture does it. There's no academic is sitting down watching Evangelion and said, Dude, "We should make this this." For some reason, Death Note became amazingly popular. SAO became amazingly popular. Right. It resonated with fans and viewers but, at a time. I mean, like, there's and changed things. I think there's it's, there's kind of an odd dissonance between like like Evangelion inspired everything else. Like, it's absolutely always fair to look at Eva because like it just completely you know affected everything after it. So like you kind of have to look at it. But when you look at Miyazaki, like. Some of his film, like Spirited Away, is it was the highest grossing film of all time, and it doesn't feel like it really affected the greater whole of anime all that much, you know? Like, maybe his earlier films had much bigger impacts, and maybe that's why Spirited Away well, didn't did. have to have one. But, like, I, I always feel like Miyazaki has 
at least in his later years, been like a distant guy. Like his movies don't even feel like they're a part of anime. They don't feel like they're a part of the the culture surrounding them. You know, and that's how that just shows you how much anime has changed. So like Miyazaki is an artur filmmaker, and in the eighties, his films are like Eva. They changed everything. Right. So like Sh- uh, shojo and Moe is like because of Miyazaki, and then. Ava changed everything after that. And the reason why he doesn't seem relevant now is because he doesn't make anime. Yeah. He makes films that happen to be animated in anime. And the industry that most of us are familiar with and consume is different than the one that he, he started in and is still making films for. The films he makes are a dying breed in anime and they're celebrated because we won't have them very soon. Anymore. Yeah. Interestingly, um, I think he... also Miyazaki in a lot of ways is a marketing tool because movies that are similar to his from Ghibli don't do as well if they don't have the Miyazaki brand yeah. name. And just, I mean, and this applies to, this applies also to like, um, I think a lot of, you know, Mamoru Oshii and someone who I haven't seen as much analysis of, but you guys can, tell me if he's been brought up in a lot in any of these articles in the era in any of these journals satoshi kon who yep. felt completely outside of anime like and i don't think satoshi kon's work ever like changed anime in any way like he was basically making um like live action movies in animation that could do things that live action movies couldn't and that's why it was special you know but like no one copied him and no one can copy him to the point that they can't even finish his last movie because they can't find anybody who can copy him. You know, yeah. and it's like like when we when we look at those and we we study those and we say like, oh, I'm going to study anime. I'm going to look at all these Satoshi Kon movies. I'm like, you're not studying anime. You're studying Satoshi Kon. You know, it's like a different story. And I completely agree with you that Satoshi Kon was not an anime director. He was just a director. Uh, he was a visionary, just as Miyazaki is. Um, they just use the medium of anime for their craft. I think Satoshi Kon did do a couple live action stuff, right? Uh, well, Perfect Blue was supposed to be a live action film, and they didn't. Uh, have I mean, a it was. For it was it. called Black Swan, Bazinga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I, he never oh, actually. Oh, oh. He never actually directed. I think he wrote for a live action film, but he never directed one. But uh, yeah, so I have a we uh, series. So so I have a series of lingering comments here. Um, oh. So the first one here is that um, there has there has there is actually a good amount of work written about Satoshi Kon. Ironically, by Napier, Napier has at, has written quite a few articles about Kon. Um, Cinema Anime has an entire chapter written by Napier about Kon. Um, we did a whole book on him. We did a whole book that had him. Uh, um, didn't we uh, interview someone on Satoshi Kon? Well, who was that? Straight Dog of Radar? Fuck. That was, no. that was Mamoru Oshii. No, that was it. Oh! Was, that was there you Brian go. Rip. There you go. Uh, the second See, one. See, that's... Listen, by the way, doing like a year of books is like, fuck, they all just blend together. So... Uh, so... Yeah, the in second Cinema one, Anime, wasn't probably... she talking about a Perfect Blue and its relation to like the male gaze and uh, yes. reflection? Yep. Yeah. The second one is we should probably get to the other two parts of the sort of three-part system she set up here. Yeah. The second one is the apocalyptic, uh, and the third is the elegiac. The apocalyptic, in this instance, is revelation and destruction, oftentimes existing at the same time. And the whole idea is supposed to capture the sort of uh, sort of post-war calamity, sort of catastrophe, sort of identity. Um, and it's very much a postmodern sort of rendition. She's emphasizing the postmodernism of anime in a lot of ways. This idea that there's pastiche. It's a very Jamesonian idea. The second, uh, the, the third one is elegiac. Elegiac is a sort of wistfulness, a, a sort of longing in a particular way, and how that sort of may manifest. Um, in terms of the argument as she presents in her book here, um, a really sort of problem I have with this sort of triad is that. She, by sort of, so we can, you know, someone could argue, well, you know, she's just commenting on anime as it is presented at at the time. But the problem here is that she has mentioned, as I've stated before in later interviews, that it still holds up. 
Well, I think there's a huge problem there because I don't think it really holds up still because there's yeah. a really big sort of category that doesn't really fall into any of these four, which if we're going to be borrowing from a Japanese uh, critic, uh, Uno Sunehiro, he talks about the Nichijoke and the everyday stories. Yeah. And they don't really fall into any of these three. Yeah, I mean, because... you like that's why I was stressing that I feel like... Because I feel like what she would say is like, well, you could uh, look at Kaon and there's an element of the festival in there. And I'm like, ah, if you stretch it, sure, I guess. But, uh, you know, like, well, if we have a, oh, what do you know? This guy came up with a much better term uh, that, that actually does describe what it's doing. So why don't we look at the Nietzsche Joke, you know? Um, forget about your damn trinity. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, and, yeah, and, I think and I that's also... where the book really dates itself. Um, yeah. When I was reading this, well, uh, I was well, thinking I a lot about the Niji JK and trying because... to apply them, and it's just like, eh, I, don't, I don't know if some of these series really are applicable to I don't even know if it even these. dates itself, because Azumanga Daio was considered sort of the first big Niji JK, and that came out in 2003. I don't think she's two thousand two. It it's not mentioned in two thousand two. Yeah, she rewrote this. In <laughs> Sorry, I, I've been like two thousand and five. Every single book I've been reading, I've been correcting the dates all these and on all these. Like the big mistake I found here was that she says that uh, the Piero Piero Wafo episode of uh, Cowboy Bebop is episode twenty one, but it's actually episode twenty. Twenty. And she says Wolf Serene came out in 2004. I used to, I used to have the OVA came out in 2004. The show ran from January 2003 to July 2003. So I don't know who's proofreading um, this, these books, but... This seems to be a recurring theme to a lot of like, <laughs> yeah. anime academic books where like they get the dates wrong and none of the editors seem to catch it. They don't. Because yeah. like none of them are as invested in it as, as you did guys they, are. Did they have Anime News Network... Uh up to date but well yeah they did because i used to i fucking used anime news network in 2004 so yeah they didn't check um <laughs> uh well to me it it dates it in the sense of um you know bringing up the apocalyptic which i do think i mean in anime to this day uh there's still anime has a tendency to end in a big apocalyptic scene but it was way more popular back then and i don't think it was entirely like you know people always like to uh to bring up the post-war element of it like akira obviously there's a big fucking nuclear bomb <laughs> obviously symbolic of a nuclear bomb but at the same time akira is like totally road warrior mad max like which anime was hugely influenced by at the time you know all the handmade movies of the 80s um, like, I mean, if you read the Akira manga, uh, the entire second half of it, it just literally becomes a, a post-apocalypse Mad Max story. So, you know, you also have to look at just what were the trends of the time and, uh, Blade Runner and, and Mad Max were extremely popular in Japan. They ripped it off a thousand, ripped both of them off a thousand times in the eighties with a million different OVAs. And so like that kind of apocalyptic imagery, while, you know, it does have, uh, an element of like, this is a part of Japanese society. There's also an element of this is a pop cultural phenomenon that was everywhere in the world and they were well aware of it. And when you look at anime now, the apocalypse still survives in there we still have ends of the worlds but not very popular today for sure like i'm thinking of anime i've watched in the last couple you know in the last well, year and a half and I, you know yeah you've got, <laughs> well <laughs> yeah, you've i got mean big order. it's it's funny because like i actually think her section on the apocalypse is probably the one that sort of holds up the best of time because one of the things she gets at in terms of the apocalypse um, is the idea of a personal apocalypse when she gets yeah. into that, into Ava. And that's essentially sort of, that's that's very much sort of a a precursor to Western scholarship on Sakaike fiction. Um, and, you know, what's one of the biggest sort of grossing uh, anime, or I think it is the biggest grossing anime right now, which is Kimi no Nawa, which itself is a Sakaike apocalypse, a post-Fukushima Sakaike. Yeah, that does make sense. Biggest grossing just, anime, biggest grossing Japanese film of all time, I think. Well, did, yeah, I think yeah so. did it beat out Titanic? Yeah, yeah. well, um, Japanese film. Oh, Titanic. Okay. I know it beat out Spirit Away. Yeah. Yes, it it conquered Spirit Away to take the title as the number one. 
and it did it before ever making it to the United States. Yeah. Power of Southeast Asia. <laughs> the power of the power of the Chinese market. Yeah. Um and well, you know, you can even look at it through the perspective of say um, you know, that that's why I focused on Death Note as the first sort of apocalyptic video. Um, you know, the entire idea of Death Note was the idea of revelation and you know, Death Note's sort of sabaibuke fiction, survival type fiction that Tsunehiro calls it, has its roots arguably from Evangelion and the sort of world type apocalypses. And, you know, whereas Evangelion, Evangelion is sort of really a perfect storm of an apocalyptic tale because so many things happened around it that it really hit at a very perfect moment in sort of Japanese catastrophe history that everything really ends up being measured against it but i think death note is really interesting in itself because it's a post 911 it's a post junichiro koizumi ref neoliberal reform work that itself is apocalyptic in a lot of ways um do you think so i think that's yep so so by bouquet i don't i don't know yep. too much about the term i would assume it originates from like battle royale yes and uh, that's did you watch that's... the scent anime stuff video <laughs> i i did i don't remember it <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, so man, what a burn. So the um, so the I, oh sorry, what was your specific question? Oh, Katie? just simply um, because I'm I'm wondering if if you would consider Death Note uh Sabibuke, do you think it owes more to Ava than it does to Battle Royale? Um, so the thing is that Sabibuke, so essentially Sabibuke fiction or survival type fiction that it's often translated, um is an off the same of... word <laughs> that's yeah. why it's translated that <laughs> it's just an english word pronounced funny Sabaiburu. um yeah. so that particular type is actually an offshoot or to, to some people it's a subtype of sakaike um so it so death note really draws a lot from battle royale but battle royale draws a lot from Ava. So it's kind of a both. But Battle Royale's before Ava. Um Battle Royale's from the eighties. Was it? Was it? Yeah, I believe the I mean it's originally okay. a novel. Oh well, maybe I'm wrong. Ninety oh nineteen ninety six, so I guess it is after Ava. Well I don't think Battle Royale was like directly like I I wouldn't be crazy to say that Battle Royale was like a direct sort of offshoot of Ava in that the, the creator was like, right. dog, I'm going to make my own Ava. Yeah. Um, but I think that sort of the, the ideas that are, I don't know. It might be some other survival story you're thinking of. Um, but I think the, uh, the sentiment, the sentiment that battle Royale sort of is trying to capture uh, really you know, it might have evolved independently, but survival type fiction, as Sunihiro would call it, does draw a lot of influence from Sakaike types. Um, and the whole idea is, you know, there's this game. Um, the There are these rules that society places upon young people, and young people either navigate or right. breaks down these rules. I, I usually call them death game shows, personally. But uh, survival K sounds, uh, you know better it sounds it sounds, ba <laughs> it sounds, sounds more collegiate. badass and foreign <laughs> uh, um, it, it, I, I think, I that think everyone just, is everyone just a wants to be able to put k at the end of stuff because you know it's cool yeah Remember back I, I when k was just k is making k? a bit of a comeback recently with uh handshakers is the recent um, like big sabai bouquet title well, I mean, Persona there's always, five. there Persona always five is, is one. Okay. Like, I think that's, that's like the most, like, so, so that genre is like, like, guaranteed there will always be a big one. You know, like, there's always going to be something huge in pop culture that is a Battle Royale knockoff. Like, Hunger Games, or a Death Note, or a uh, Mirai Nikki, or a... Uh, well, you know, it's such a compelling trope, and you go back to like, Lord of, of the Flies is like that too. Yeah, you know, well, Joe well, would that's actually what I argue that's where I would say it was an it to, you know? title. Huh? To what? To uh, Lord of the Flies. Well, he told me that one time he didn't think that Sword Art Online was Sabaibuke. Sorry Wait, if I'm throwing you uh, under the bus a bit, Joe, but what? 
What? You had, you had told me one time, and I remember this, that you had said that you did not think Sword Art Online was the Baibuke fiction. Did, did you say I think or I didn't think? You didn't think. He's saying you did not think. He keeps cutting out. Oh, my um, bad. Yeah, Roger. I couldn't tell if it was me, but I think it's you. Oh, okay. I don't know. I mean, like, I might not. Th- I don't know. I don't. I don't really think Sora Online is a I really think it's like in the beginning. the The main thrust, the main appeal of the show is like these people are put into a situation where they're all kind of at each other's throats, and uh, you know, like, like what makes Kirito a big hero in the beginning is that he puts a target on his back, and everybody kind of wants him dead, you know. And there's like you this sure tension between the beater? people. Huh? Because what? Because he's not a beater. <laughs> yeah, because he's a he's a beater. He's a he's a major beater. <laughs> and I mean, if you, you say he's a a master beater, I think. <laughs> Sorry. I think the existence <laughs> of the anime confuses things a bit because of the fact that, like, if you just take the first book in isolation, where it's like without all the filler bullshit, then you've got what is essentially a clear cut, like you know. A, a a death game story about like a, a an edge like every, it, it's more of a straightforward like drama narrative as opposed to then undercutting all that tension by going in and doing all this other stuff and then the series continues and it has nothing to do with that anymore so i feel like there's like like the basis the foundation of the first arc of sword art online is like supposed to be a, a sabaibuke show and then it just completely fucks it up as badly as it possibly could and that's why Wah- it doesn't who? look like one <laughs> <laughs> Why wasn't there an editor to go to the whoever the fuck was writing SAO and be like, you know this awesome setup you created? Yeah, you should just don't ruin it. Just stick with well, that. Well, that's, that's the thing. Like, he I don't understand SAO. He, well, it had the best setup. He really didn't because the first book is j- – the first book is just the actual plot, and then he wrote a second book that's just side stories, and then the anime just shoved the side stories into the early part. So if you read the book, you would get this one tightly written – well, not tightly written, but, you know, you'd get a, a, a tight narrative, uh, and then you could read all these side stories, and then the anime just uh, ruins the, the narrative by throwing all the side stories into the main story, and nobody cares, and it kills the tension. So, so like, like, are you saying that the main book was – like he's stuck in a video game and like like the first video he's stuck in a fantasy video game and he's got to get to the top of the tower or something yeah like the very first book is ju- is just the plot like if you took the first 14 episodes of the show cover the first two books of the light novels but the second so book was entirely side that? stories you know so like after the first 14 episodes the show's over right you like, should never have watched any of the show no one should <laughs> ever watch any of sword art online if you don't want to kill yourself but come on the sister's so hot she is really hot <laughs> <laughs> she's super boom hot. oh my okay, mic clipped. Uh, so one of the things i think is sort of really interesting um or at least, like, I, I, I guess a question in regards to this book here is that how much do you think of anime from Akira to Hao's Moving Castle is strategic? Um, and what I mean by that is that a lot of these works are works that would, to some degree, be fairly available to people who would be getting into anime. Like, this is intentional. Someone else pointed out that she created it, she, she thought up a thesis, and then found things to, like, this is... Everything's intentional in this book. Nothing, nothing happens on accident. Well, I'm, I'm not meaning that. Like, I'm not meaning the construction of the thesis, but that her focus is no. But I mean, like, on that very... was one example of her yeah. strategic planning. Like, yeah, she picked intentionally broad, popular things. You know. Yeah, you and and I definitely it. think it's by no means a coincidence that she included stuff like, um, like the eyes being important in Roroni Kenshin, Inuyasha, and then Cowboy Bebop too. Well, eyes, like, getting back to Blade Runner, I, like, the thematic element of eyes is one that carries over multiple works, not just Blade Runner, but it's been around for a long time, and it is kind of like this homaging effect throughout works, you know? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I wasn't here. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, so we all decided that you like SAO. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I de- I uh, inevitably have gotten this way derailed and we're, we haven't even been talking about the book for a while, but um, I should have warned you that any podcast I come on is automatically an hour longer than it usually is, so. 
Uh, well, then that means we have another hour to go, because this is usually how long we go. Uh, she could, like, when th- thinking of who she thought this, the audience of this book was for, and what she was constructing it, I think she did a compelling job, albeit a little messy, because once again, this book falls into this problem that a lot of academic books fall in, where it's multiple essays strung together very loosely, and they go, ta-da, it's a book! When really it's like, Four books in one with very loose connections between them, you know. Yeah, I I don't know. I think I, I think Thomas Lamar is the anime machine of whom I'm very good friends with. Uh, uh, did I mention I'm good friends with Thomas Lamar? Um, <laughs> I think Thomas Lamar's the anime machine is a very tightly written book. But that's not what we're not talking about. Thomas Lamar's book. We're talking about this book, Dick. <laughs> By the way, my good friend Elon Musk says, fuck you. Right, Elon? <laughs> um, well, okay, so I guess... Shout out to Thomas Lamar. Jesus Christ. So I guess let's sort of look at it. So I guess a question would be, so we've got the elegiac, the apocalyptic, and the carnival, or the festival. Um, let's sort of ask the question here. Why do you, you think she might want to try and implement the sort of holistic structure to understanding anime? Like, what purpose does this serve? Make it a lot fucking easier for new people to understand it. Like, But does it really, though? Because this is post-Helen McCarthy, and McCarthy has written very introductory books on anime. Well... I think it's a. I think what this is good for is an introduction to analyzing anime and just thinking about it, like because a lot of this is just like like just interesting little analytical tidbits. Some of it, like I said earlier, is kind of obvious. Like you know, if you've seen the show, sometimes you feel like she's just describing the text of the show, but then other times, uh, you know, she might talk about like a the symbolism in a show or like just generally the way she described ranmo one half for instance like it felt like all stuff I, i've seen all of ranmo one half and all of its stuff that i felt like i intuitively understood but didn't appreciate the significance of because if you just watch ranmo one half you're just watching a comic a goofy comedy show you know and like even though what is appealing about the show is all this stuff she's describing all these sort of deeper connections that it makes with uh you know sexuality and with uh gender and the, the performative nature of it and like what it means to what it would mean to be a boy who transforms into a girl you know like all that stuff is pr- is exactly why i like ranma you know like it's what i like about the show and yet because if you just watched Ranma, you would just think of it as like, yeah, it's that goofy comedy show about the guy who transforms into a girl. Like, it doesn't put it doesn't put at the forefront these messages. These are and and even you know I don't know if they were intended to be like if if they were written in like with great purpose. It's more that maybe Rumiko Takahashi just kind of intuitively understood why these are in like why these characters would be good you know she just thinks hey if there's a boy who transforms into a girl uh here's what that would mean for all the relationships with his family and stuff um here's what that would mean for this and that and she's not thinking about like what what her making those assumptions says about japanese society uh which it intrinsically does so you know what she's doing here in this book is like it's really funny there's two different moments where she brings up Rumiko Takahashi quotes, uh, where Takahashi basically says, I just thought it would be fun. And she's like, but did she really just think it would be fun? Because I know Rumiko Takahashi has an interest in this uh, this certain kind of theater, and that kind of comes up in the story. So maybe subconsciously she was thinking about this stuff. Like, she, she kind of, you know, like, tries to psychoanalyze Rumiko Takahashi uh, beyond her her own flippant or humble quotes about her work. And yeah, I think if you are someone who hasn't thought much about what anime means or says in in the mere fact of its existence, this could be a good way to, like, kickstart that. Of course, now you can watch a Digibro video and get the same effect. Am I saying that the whole time I was reading this book, I was thinking I could write this but better? Yes, I was. That is what I'm saying. (laughs) It's actually interesting, though, you bring up maybe Rumiko Takahashi subconsciously thinking about these things. 
Um, because yeah. this is actually something that's, that Joe's brought up when it, in regards to authorial intent, wherein, like, sometimes these things just come naturally to the writer. And because yeah. of this, they're not really necessarily thinking about it, but it's happening. Yeah. Well, an author, subconscious, intentional or not, is writing in the context of the culture that they come from, which is a window right. into the larger morale and ethics that they have, whether they realize it or not. So, I mean, if unintentional it, elements of a story are still reflecting the culture yeah. that they came from. I mean, if an author means, tells you that they wrote this character to be quote unquote, like the, uh, the, like the most normal character, then it says a lot about that society, you know, like automatically, exactly. like if, if yeah. like when you look at, what what like what is the stereotypical anime protagonist like of a like like light novel or manga and it's always the same wimpy otaku beta male uh shut in um you know neat guy or or uh you know high school un- unassuming high school student rejecting the sexual advances of every woman around him and it's like some of this is probably just tropes and just being you know that anime is all incestuous and influenced by other anime but also it says something about like this is considered default this is what our culture you know anime culture not japanese culture necessarily but what anime culture has decided this is the 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 pure normal on on the alignment chart you know the true neutral and um that's not what it would be in America, you know, we wouldn't. And so we look at it and we go, well, that's interesting. Um, Why is that your true neutral? And maybe they can't explain it, you know? Well, different theorists have different ideas as to what that probably means. I mean, like Hiroki would, you know, Azuma Hiroki would probably argue that that's a case of database reading where uh, people can sort of jump into the deep layer and of all these character types, whereas someone probably a little bit closer to uh, media in general. I don't know, maybe sort of someone like uh, Kentaro Takakuma, he might say something more like, oh, these are these are grass-eater men. These are herbivorous men, soshiko danshi. Mm-hmm. It, it's all different. It's all different. Yeah. I mean, well, sh- yeah, it's it's different how people will interpret... Like, whether they'll think that that character is standard or not. But I think that it says that, like, we can look at the creators and that they designed this character to be normal, you know? Like, what what does that say about the char- the creator's mindset towards the world, that they see this as as standard? You know, they see this as baseline. Well, that's, that's really interesting uh, when we're talking about sort of baseline and normal, because... One of the things that gets roughly mentioned in Napier's book, and that sort of gets echoed a lot into a lot of other books as well, is sort of the the division between sort of a real world and then there's this sort of fantasy world in which a narrative of, of anime might be constructed. So I think a question that might be useful to consider is just where does the baseline sort of begin and end if you're constructing a pure fantasy world? Because, I mean, like, you know, when we talk about sexuality, that's one of the main defenses that comes up in sort of anime psychoanalysis that, oh, well, you know, the how someone feels about a sexuality, uh, how someone feels about, you know, like someone is like, if someone is a big fan of Lolly, that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't make necessarily make them a pedophile because yes, there's a I virtual so. and there's a, there's a virtual For and my there's own a sake. real... <laughs> there's a virtual and a real sexuality there's a distinction of sexualities so yeah. now if we take this line of reasoning and apply it to cultural contexts how much of that culture is virtual and how much of that is real yeah that and that's a that is a great question which is why i said maybe not japanese society but otaku society and even then i think like <clears throat> honestly i think that the standard male lead is not really like i think a lot of people think of it as like he's supposed to be someone who everybody can relate to and i think it's not that he's supposed to be a blank slate he's supposed to be literally no one you know tabula like rasa? i don't know what tabula rasa means but... blank slate <laughs> okay. yeah it's he i i agree with you did you they are supposed to be blank slates yeah because i mean there's a reason that the same exact characters 
like the ones that the shows that most prominently feature these kinds of characters are the the more pornographic shows you know it's like the 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 racy comedies the stuff that the so the shows that are about the main character having relationships with the women and so the idea is that the main character is so generic that you don't actually process him like you don't really think of him as like you think of him as the cipher through which you experience uh, sexual relationships with these girls but he is not he is a non-entity and this is why um in my own uh, videos, I have this tendency to always just refer to the the male lead as the main character or the male lead because I can never remember their names. And this came up in um, I'm doing a weekly podcast about Aramanga Sensei and uh, with with the YouTuber Best Guy Ever, and he was saying like, yeah, I can never remember the guys' names in these shows. And I said, because who cares? They're not characters. They're not there for you to care ab- about at all. You know, um, you know, every once in a while, one of them has like a little bit of an edge to them and those are like everybody's favorites you know like uh hachiman from uh yeah love comedy like you know that show is obviously trying to make the main character an actual character but when you watch a lot of these ones it's like they are meant to fa- like monster musume that guy is not meant to be real i don't even think he has a face in the manga if i remember it's, correctly it's actually interesting cuz they're taking so this though. they're they're taking this a step further in uh, some shows like uh, they've been doing it in hentai for a while with works like a uh, pero pero teacher and the like um but now recently with like anatore ex and name one drops. room i like where this is going <laughs> with like anatore ex and like one room they yeah. the main character the is literally, literally in first person exist. view and he just doesn't like he nods like he doesn't right. say really anything um, and he has no I mean, voice. I think in the case of Anitore EX, I think that's partly because it's a workout video. Because, like, if you watch real workout videos, it's always the instructor addressing you directly through the TV. So I think it's partly just that aesthetic. But, yeah, uh, there's definitely also an element of it. Like, you know, it's just you with the girl. Well, yeah, Pero Pero Teacher, they actually do, I believe, show the guy in a few shots. But it's mostly from a first person perspective. Yeah, I, I've never seen that one, but oh. I have seen any Tore. <laughs> so, in regards to, so getting back to the book because that's that's my job to sort of yeah. derail conversation to get back. Rerail to the book. conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Railroading. Death of the conversation. Um. So, what is what do you think? Okay, so we've sort of discussed the sort of the gaps that the book has sort of how it's aged what do you think sort of is the strongest chapter or the strongest idea that napier presents i've already sort of explained my position which is that i think her work on the apocalypse still holds up for the most part but that's also because there's a very clear bias from my part because that's probably the part i'm the most familiar with well i I think probably in terms of my favorite chapter was probably the one talking about urusei yatsura um video girl i and oh my goddess mostly because she only really speaks of that time period so the work she's not saying like these things um in the there's no like updated version saying whether or not these things apply she's only speaking of that specific time frame and it i believe it's very reflective of that specific time frame yeah um well i'm not gonna lie uh so i read the first 50 pages of this like back in march when when we first were assigned the book and then the rest of it uh in the last 10 hours or so i haven't slept and i got to like page 150 or so yeah and by that point i'd gotten so frustrated that i just kind of started skimming the rest of it so i haven't exactly read the whole book um to pick out a favorite chapter so I, I did skim through and read parts of that Video Girl Eye section, which I did like just because, again, I hadn't seen Video Girl Eye. And it was interesting to hear this take on it as, um, it's not the first time I've heard it referred to as, like, being kind of dramatically different from what's typical of the genre, but I hadn't really known why. So it's very good. You should but, watch it. Yeah, I've, I've heard as much. A anime blogger called 2D Telitoscope was a really big fan of it. And he was a cool guy but uh yeah so i guess my favorite part was uh the the akira and ranma one half section because after that i started getting bashed <laughs> like after that we got into the 
I mean, I didn't even, again, I, I, I know I've said this like three times, but I don't disagree with any of her stances on the shows individually. Like, when she was talking about the hentai um, stuff, like, I thought I was interested in the points she was making about the shows. I was like, yeah, this is this is a very even-handed interpretation of these particular uh, pornographic anime. It just bothered me that she stopped at four and, like, one genre of it, you know? And then when we got into Mecca, that's when I really was like, all right, hold on. <laughs> you don't know anything about Mecca. And I wasn't wasn't really in agree with, with the stuff she was saying about Evangelion. Like, I don't know. She took, like, a... She she kind of introduces it like Evangelion has so much going on and like you know it's it's this huge deep series and she picks this very odd path through it and you know as soon as the word deconstruction starts getting thrown around with Ava I start to hit, my eyes haze over and I start like sighing um, deeper and deeper to um, I guess to sort of defend Napier a little bit here. Um, her Evangelion section is very reminiscent of work by uh, Kotani Mari, um, mm -hmm. who's a Japanese feminist and lit critic who has written actually a ton about Ava. Um, I think Napier's the, the, the trouble that comes about in Napier's section on Evangelion is that she was trying to condense a lot of uh, Mari's ideas right. into very short periods. And so there's it's cutting out a lot of very fine details that yeah. Katani Mari actually brings to Ava. And you can see it when um, when she talks about the Kristaven abject, you know, the, the thing that gets rejected to constitute the subject of being. Um, yeah. It's not really discussed as deeply as Mari actually talks about it. Um, and and I, I remember that uh, a specific detail that had kind of pulled me out of that section while I was trying to read it um, was because this is an area where I actually had to stop and think, like, what was this, like, is this scene as she was saying? So, she's describing the fight scene from the first episode, and how it erupts into this, you know, this extremely violent hand-to-hand uh, -hand beatdown. And she's talking about this idea of, like, Shinji tearing away at this uh, parental figure that is the angel. But Shinji isn't controlling the robot in that scene, you know? In... In that scene, the Ava's gone berserk, he is locked out, and it's just doing whatever. And so, but on the one hand, she had addressed the idea that, you know, he's he has achieved 100% synchronization with the Ava. So what I'm wondering is, is she suggesting that Shinji is subconsciously asking the Ava to do this somehow? Because I've always interpreted the scene as the Ava itself, which is Shinji's mom, is trying to protect him. You know, like, it's... It's the Ava acting. It's not Shinji acting. So for her to, you know, work this idea of, like, Shinji attacking this parental figure, I'm like, well, he's not doing it, you know? And so that's where it got into, like, this interpretive realm where I'm like, well, I don't know if I, if, I don't know if I am even watching the same show you are. Like, I don't know if that's happening. So it makes it a little bit dif more difficult to then engage with all the things that she's trying to address with those themes because I'm not sure if it's even happening, you know? I think the smoking gun in sort of Napier's understanding of Ava is that because she's drawing from a Christavan perspective, and Christa Julia Christava is a feminist who's drawing upon Lacanian psychoanalysis, who is essentially reworking the works of, of, of Freud in some particular ways. The idea for synchronization to Napier, I believe, is to sort of it's a situation where the subject falls into the mother and sort of in psychoanalytical language, the mother represents the sort of godlike imaginary in which this sort of amorphous state in, in that the subject sort of controls everything, but at the same time has no definition. And I think she's stressing that lack of definition. So I don't think Napier would actually say distinctly that Shinji has any control at all. I think it's just that he's fallen into sort of the Lacanian trap in that the subject has fallen into the mother. It's it's a very Christaven perspective. It's a very it's very difficult to explain. Yeah, you're a little out of my depth, honestly. <laughs> I'm, still trying, I'm still like, well does that mean that Shinji killed the damn angel or not? Um Um the I the idea so I don't think she's trying to say that he chose anything at all. 
because the whole idea of subject formation for um, Christavian psychoanalysis is that the subject lines are so blurry that there it is constantly in danger of falling back into what's called the mother and the mother is the the big other the big o other um it's it's very tricky to explain this without going into psychoanalytical terms and explaining it just makes it even worse but i'm going to give it a <laughs> shot i'm going to give it a shot let's see if i, I think I, I i i i get what you mean that okay. that he uh that essentially he is a part of the thing that's happening not so much that he's doing it um but like it is occurring and that still means something in terms of him having uh you know he is in the ava essentially am, am I, is the thing i'm saying that doesn't sound like it makes sense matching up with the thing that you were saying that doesn't sound like it makes sense i can't tell <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I think these things can sort of run concurrently, so I think that's sort of the challenge. I think they can yeah. both exist at the exact same time, which is hmm. yeah. I, I I I feel like I get where you're coming from, and I understand. I mean, I know that Ava is deeply based in these kinds of psychological principles. It wouldn't surprise me if that was an intentional decision to like hearken to this particular um, concept, you know. Uh, so, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I just, reading that particular part was where I, in the book, was where I started to feel like this is, this is escaping my understanding of the subject matter, you know, whether or not she's uh, quote unquote right about it. It's just like, I, that was the point where, whereas every other show she described even if it was a different perspective than what i would have brought to it i thought yeah okay and with that one i was like what <laughs> and then from then on i just kind of was like all right i'm having difficulty parsing this anymore and i, I skimmed through the rest yeah it's very sort of it's, it's, and and sorry and, and in part the reason i skimmed through the rest is that this book does not ever feel like it's building to something it very much always feels like it's meandering through different ideas. And I eventually went and just read the conclusions section, which is basically, so yeah, there's no conclusions really to be drawn here. Um, I've shared with you some interesting ideas that I hope you'll think about. And that's cool <laughs> that, that it's over. I think the, I think the challenge that uh, Napier is faced with is that like, she's trying to set up this thing. She's trying to set up this sort of quasi structural idea in that you know all of these things can be connected somehow and all of these chapters that she throws out are supposed to uh, sort of crop up her 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 general thesis uh, which is you know there's this three major parts that are worth focusing on and they all reflect different parts of Japanese culture which I think is a fair thesis um but it does sort of show that she's going for a wide analysis you know there's so many specific there's so yeah. many works that she's drawing upon at any one particular moment. I mean, the if whole you look net at... of this book is cast way too wide. Yeah. It's just like, and that's what that's what dates it. Unfortunately, you know, like if if it weren't for the idea that like these conceits she's presenting can be applied to all of this genre or all of anime, then it would it would age perfectly fine. You could just say, oh, this is an interesting analysis of Akira and Ranma one half and Ghost in the Shell, you know, as opposed to this is an interesting uh, treatise on anime as a whole. I don't know if that's the proper use of the word treatise, but it sounded cool in that sentence. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I and I think that's a that's an absolutely that's an absolutely valid criticism of this book. Um. Because I don't think this book is at any sort of sort of refined identity because I think as I mentioned earlier, this is a very much a a product, I believe, of the works that had come out in the nineties. You know, if you look at the works of say Frederick Schote and uh Helen McCarthy, a lot of their works are essentially, well, here's, let's take a look at manga and let's take a look at all the, the companies that are publishing manga right now. And I'm, you know, we're going to write one or two pages about them. And you look at the works of like Helen McCarthy, um, her stuff is essentially, 
uh, 500 heroes and villains in anime and manga, and it's literally a book that's 400 pages long, and it's 500 heroes and villains in anime and manga, and they're all one paragraph long. And I think Napier is trying to figure out a particular way to approach this on a more, on a, on a deeper lens, but she hasn't really gotten to that point yet she hasn't really gotten to a sort of refinement that we that we're starting to see much later on in anime scholarship i mean um if i had to characterize what what you know broadly my biggest issue with this book again it's just the fact that our perspective is so much bigger now and in general with anime writing i mean i haven't read a whole lot of academic stuff but um of of what little I've seen and particularly seeing people write, you know, analytic analytically and stuff online, I continually come across, and I'm not saying that you, you have to know everything about anime to talk about anime, but if you want to talk about all of anime, you kind of do, you know? And so there's this, there's this feeling now that like, we now have access to everything. Every, the whole backlog has all been subbed, you know, well, notwithstanding like the fifties and before, um, and even some of that's coming to the surface. So, like, now we have the chance that we can go back and look at everything and really start to, like, paint the big picture. And instead of just, you know, scrounging together whatever little bits and tidbits we have, like, what little, oh, that, that's kind of an interesting thing that pops up in three or four shows. Now we can look at those three or four shows in this context of, like, everything that came out that year you know was ghost in the shell like the other stuff that came out in 1995 or was it totally different we know now because we can watch all of them and it creates these these broader sensations of the time you know of the the culture of what was popular what was just totally out there and what was actually super indicative of what was going on you know um, which something like a, a Mamoru Oshii film never was, <laughs> you know, like never indicative of exactly what's going on because the man's a completely different type of director. Um, but, or, 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 and yet in some ways, totally indicative because if you look at, you know, what he's doing in the mid 80s, it's like there's this OVA boom and there's all this money going around. And so someone like him can make movies at all is indicative of the times, um, you know, like Robot Carnival got made. How the hell did that happen? Um, so, yeah, like it's just this. it's like these are all interesting ideas. But as soon as you've seen more anime than Susan Napier had seen in 2001, all of it starts to feel kind of paltry and small and not broad enough to be presented as though it's broad. You cannot slot all of anime into the three categories she presents here as though you can slot all of anime into them, you know? Um, yeah. And we know that now, and we know that that was true even at the time. We can look back and say, ah, I think you missed a few, you know? But where does, where does Sazai-san fit into those three categories? <laughs> Well, she actually does bring up Sazai-san. Oh, so, yeah, song but I have to book. ask. Sazai-san is obviously apocalyptic. Yeah. But, like, <laughs> what is Sazai-san? It's the... I'm being it's, serious. Oh, like, it's the longest running and most popular anime series of all time. Is that, um... It's, it's the Conan? longest running TV show of all time. Like, literally, yeah. it's got the Guinness Book of World Records for it. It's okay, so that's it's, a bad example. It, it's, like, it's just a domestic life show about uh, a Japanese family that's like five minute episodes has been running since the sixties. Oh, yeah, I forget. Yeah, it's which... like if Blue's Clues was an anime and it never. Okay, <laughs> I, I forget which so... um, which part of the book she brings up Sazai San, but she compares the uh, the mother figure of that, I believe, to the mother in Urusei Yatsura. So I think it's in that chapter. Yes. Yes, yeah. I do. I think I remember that happening. But does she say whether she thinks it fits into any of those three categories? <laughs> no, like, it was just a quick nod to it. Because I'm curious. I mean, and and if she doesn't want to count that as anime, that's fair. Like, if we want to make this distinction between, like, anime and animated Japanese TV shows, which is what, like, uh, Mother's Basement's trying to do, and I totally disagree with him on it, but, like, he's trying to recharacterize anime as, like, an art movement or whatever. I think it's bullshit, but, um, you know, I, I think it would be fair if she wanted to Something say, well, tells I'm not me he talking won't be able about Sazai, so. <laughs> What'd you say? Something tells me he won't be able to do that. No. No. Not as, not as long as I've got more subs than him. <laughs> 
<laughs> fight him tooth and nail on the fucking uh. beach. <laughs> I'll kill him. <laughs> Iron assassins to stop Jesus him. Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, it's fascinating because that section on the mother is very much, it, it's very reminiscent of Anne Allison who wrote a book in 1996 about mother-son plots. Uh, particularly, I believe, uh, my memory is a little shoddy here, but about oftentimes sort of erotic mother-son plots. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh. and how they sort of reveal specific spatial economic anxieties of the of the Japanese around that time. It's a very fascinating and very interesting book. Um, but yeah, it's very reminiscent of Van Allison. I didn't really have a point. I just wanted to throw that out. I thought it was okay. interesting. Uh, <laughs> so is it time to hit the wrap it up button? Because I feel like one we've, we've been talking uh, on the same well, thing okay. for the last hour. Uh, so well, let's 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 look at it this way. Um, if there was one, if there was one specific thing that you would say to sort of change the book, what would it be? Oh man, fucking the title to well, yeah, <laughs> uh, to to make it ten books uh, that each goes into the subject completely. Like instead of this book about these three, these three subjects of anime, and then most of the books not even really about those three. It's about all these identity I- ideas, and then also about like. Uh, history revisionism all of those should be their own books write a book about identity in anime write a book just about gender identity in anime uh because she kind of did she kind of just did yeah like i i feel like if the book had a different title this conversation would be moot right it, the, like if she it's the title this... and just the, the the opening and closing bits you know like the the forward the afterward and just the fact that this is yeah like you said earlier it's four books in one but yeah. but each of those books is too short because they're all in the same book and they all are talking well, all about like, like the academics shows, you know it's like the it's an academic essay so like their essays are 50 ish pages and stuff and they make those books right she kind of just lumped them all together I just, like I even if it's even if we're not making it long um the way I would have approached something like this I don't know why I think I'm such a big shot that that makes that whatever my approach is is obviously better um like I a uh, recent video I did uh 10 st- five steps to improve a fan service anime right and it's like I just put in like every fan service anime I'd ever seen you know like any show I could even think of makes it into this video and because yeah, because you can cover so many different smaller nuances and facets of it. So like instead of just like here's what Ranma has to say about gender identity in Japan, let's get like every show that explore let's get fucking Stop He Body Kun from the 80s and let's get uh Hodo Musko from 2011. Obviously she couldn't have, but let's, you know, let's bring in all of the shows that have commented on this and make a huge book about it and and then like really get to the heart of what has anime been trying to tell us about gender identity all this time i, I don't yeah. want to re- like i know i've said this already but like most of those shows are unimportant like that's not to say they're not important to you and to their fans but they're unimportant i don't think there's such the thing as an unimportant like, anime I can't, I can't abide by that idea that any like, of them are unimportant. The creature from the Black Lagoon or some other shitty sci-fi movie from the '60s is not as important as Midnight Cowboy. And I, I just Patton. think like there's a huge but, danger. The, the point in, I'm making is like, like, no, it's not. It's like there's adding in every little thing is one redundant, and two, it's tedious and I don't think so at all. Muddles the point, but. You you judge cultural like you look at cultural trends through touchstones one because it's easier to understand for the outside person or who you're explaining to like I just what like you're essentially is trying complete, to say though. what you're trying to say is that there is a barrier to entry and this barrier is you need to have watched fifty plus shows in 1991 I'm not yeah. trying to single you out on this like this is just a thing um so like I, it don't make it seem like this is on you like it's like that's unimportant. I don't know. To What's me, that's her job. Is to me, that's if you're writing about 
to me, like the idea of like, I want to have a comprehensive knowledge on this subject means consume everything related to this subject. And it doesn't mean you have to literally watch every single anime ever. But like, if it's about, if you were doing a single topic, you would have the yeah, opportunity to. But she's not to. an anime critic. Well, she's, she's a critic written a hell of a lot she just about happened anime. to have been, she just happened to have written a, a book of, about anime. Like, she is a literary and Japanese studies critic. Well, then, like, why anime, don't we get like, somebody who's an anime critic to write? But those book? books, those books exist. <laughs> right. But I'm going to tell you right now. I'll just, I'll there just is call n- up my good friend Thomas Lamar. <laughs> there is no academic book that's going to list 50 examples because it's. It, there's no point. It's, I there's, there's I just think no that there's, that. I think you're, I think you're wrong, and that's because I think that there's, I mean, if you have two shows that literally say the same thing, no, don't name them both. You know, like if you bring up two and they basically, yeah, they are redundant, then don't do it. I'm saying that you could have like there's other shows with very different takes on gender identity that you need to have the complete picture ranma is not going to do it you know ranma is one artist's perspective on their you know what's going on in the world at the time and you know a lot of these shows are influential not in the gigantic sense that ranma is but they are important and they have you know they have a they have a, a lineage to them you know and like I don't think you can throw stuff under the bus until you've seen it, until you've seen a show and you go, okay, well, that one was a waste of time, but let's watch the next one until we find find all the ones. You know, I've had plenty of times writing a video where I, I did watch a show. It didn't help my point. But then another show that I didn't even know about turns out is uh is not only a great assistant to my point but has a rich cultural background i didn't know about because it was important in the 60s and nobody remembers it now you know like you just got to know there's not the time resources and energy for every single person to do that well i'm not asking well, every single person to do that i'm asking the people writing books about anime to do that you know like but she's not an anime critic i like again there are books written well, by people who do what you're requesting she actually has this book she actually has sold herself as an anime critic now at the time this book was written. sure i mean well that's why we're asking how would we fix this book and, and this yeah, is how i'd fix it I'm, uh, I'm, don't I'm have her write you, it. Can, <laughs> you can criticize anime and not have seen all of anime sure to ask that is, but will it be helpful will it be helpful in the long run in 20 years like this book was helpful at the time but is it helpful now? And what's wrong with it now? What's wrong with it now is that she doesn't know enough about anime. Well, so. I think her her the issues well, and ideas she raises on gender a, and identity are insightful and important to think about. All right, let me let me finish. And should, could she have done more with different shows? Yes. But the questions she's still raising are themes that are carried out through a multitude of shows. Sure. Uh, gay panic is a common trope. Yeah. Uh, the gender identity, gender bending, cross dressing thing is a common theme. Yeah. She just happened to have used Rama. Uh, I'm not to hire again. It. I'm not saying there's that any of her work here is bad. It's just that there's too little of it, and it's it's this bite sized chunk in between all this other stuff. And I want to read a book about all the ways anime is exploring sexual identity. You know, and even if you only stick with touchstones and uh and you know and stuff that applies to a broad swath of shows ramma won't be enough you know you give, give me at least 10 <laughs> give me one book 10 shows i can deal with that give me uh yeah i'll i'll, I'll make you a list the, the the top 10 most important anime rom-coms uh that involve gender identity issues and i'll i'll pass okay, it on so and... I, I think i get what you're saying <laughs> yeah. i think what you're saying is you want so like she wrote like four different books. You want yeah. each of the four little books that she wrote to have been its full fledged book. Exactly. And I think if she, yeah. So I agree with you there. I agree that if each like each one of the ideas she touches on is very interesting in its own right. Right. But there is not enough there, and it, yeah. I I would have loved more fleshing out. So I, I think we're. I'd like one book about thing, apocalyptic anime. One book about elegic anime. One book about the festival. One book about anime uh, gender identity. One book about the relationship of the anime character to the body that could possibly be the same book and and then one about the historical revisionism thing like that part of the book um 
felt like it came out of nowhere towards the end because like I'd been so mired in all this other stuff that all kind of tied into each other. And then it like almost felt like it was breaking away. And I was like, this is like a whole other research project, you know? Um, yeah. And, and, it, and it probably it was. And God to do it now would be like, like to talk about historical revisionism or historical identity now when there's literally three fucking Sengoku era shows every season for the last 10 years, you could have a, it, a unbelievable wealth of resources to talk about that today, you know? Yeah, Maybe it's interesting. Has. I actually did come to my own conclusions in regards to that because, um, she brings up this idea in when she's discussing Inuyasha about um, Sengoku Atogi Zoshi, and I, I think Joe knows what I'm getting at here. Um, the term Atogi Zoshi, of course, these fantasy stories, these fairy tales in the case of Inuyasha, hence the tagline, a feudal fairy tale, is actually applicable to the anime Atogi Zoshi from 2004, because Atogi Zoshi focuses... There are two stories, each 13 episodes long. One focuses on the Heian period of Japan, and the second one takes place in modern Japan with the same exact characters. And this is very similar to Inuyasha in that it's two different worlds from two different time periods, one being from older Japan and the other being from a more modern perspective. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, lot of shows you could explore. I, I want a book about like just the way that anime has interpreted the Sengoku period. Like, like this, how, how these characters have become these like weird aesthetic ideas instead of like having anything to do with who they were historically, you know, like, like comparing and contrasting every Oda Nobunaga in anime of which there are hundreds. Talk about Nobunaga versus like, yeah, <laughs> Nobunaga versus Nobunaga's ambition versus uh, the shinobi who works for Nobunaga. I don't remember the actual name of the show. Versus uh, the no Nogi. What was it? The the girl Nobunaga, the girl who's like from modern Japan, but then she just becomes Nobunaga in feudal times. Uh, oh yeah. Um, you know there was a uh, drifters recently. I was just sticking to ones with Nobunaga in the title. Uh, you know we could go down an infinite rabbit hole of Nobunagas, but this is. Um, in regards to like these specific sort of topics, um, if you're interested in looking at these specific ones, you can actually find a lot of them in doctoral or ma uh, master's theses because that's really where they come up, where people take one specific lens right. and they just literally just hone in on that very specific one. Right. Um, I think a really good example of a very specific honed-in piece is probably Motoko Tanaka's uh, Apocalypse in Japanese Science Fiction. It's a 2013 book, which was retrofitted from her 2011 PhD thesis. And it takes a look specifically through the apocalyptic lens of Japanese science fiction. It's not just about anime, but I think it's a very good direction to go in. Yeah. But I do echo a lot of your concerns about this, which is that like these are she's taking a very broad topic um, and its usefulness. It's limited not only in terms of the time in which it is published in, because there have been considerable changes now. Yeah. And um, but it's also limited by the fact that it's a broad look at a lot of these things, because not only by having a broad thing, you can't really go into a deep analysis without making it too thick of a book. But at the same time, it also falls into the trap of, well, how do you actually set up your epistemological and methodological frame? I mean, like, how do you decide what to look at to represent something else? Yeah. And she never really discusses exactly why to a large degree, or at least a structural degree. Yeah. And and uh, for the record, you know, my, my problem with this book um, is not that... It is like just the fact of being a broad book about anime because it's simply like you could do that. Like there could have been a, a, a book called Anime from Akira to Howl's Moving Castle that did make sense as a broad lens of the whole medium. I just don't feel like that's what she's done here. I feel like she's attacked a bunch of specific things and then not gone into them in much depth and which is why it feels so scattershot and like – these are just a bunch of ideas about anime as opposed to like actually trying to paint a broad scope 
uh, of the thing, which would probably be a much more historical thing, you know, probably more of a like timeline or a like, uh, you know, stylistic changes and like really broad stuff, like not just thematic broads, but like, um, you know, describing the entirety of what Shonen is, which she touches on a little, not much, but like. You know, there you could write a really broad book about anime that would and do so academically that would like make sense. <laughs> and, and this is uh, this is like a bunch of sh- short versions of what should have been longer essays strung into a book. Uh, and then, yeah, as you said earlier, the title's the biggest problem that it paints it as a broad analysis as opposed to a scattering of ideas. I think this is. Uh, let's see. I'm not seeing any questions or anything in the chat, but I guess we should give it about five minutes to see if anybody has any particular questions or concerns in the chat. I'm gonna go to the bathroom again. Then. All right. Have fun. I I will have fun. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, though, because this book, while it does have its many shortcomings, I I do think that I'm able to make parallels to other shows in regards to what they're discussing. Like, when they're discussing uh, Howl's Moving Castle, the core idea being that um, this shoujo age can't sustain itself forever. You can't be, like, young forever, and you can't, like... It it just can't be the focus. That's kind of why I... Yeah, this culture that japan's sustaining on itself it can't be it's not eternal and i think that idea is also reflective in maharomatic um season two in particular this um idea that um when the characters grow up spoiler alert um everything's so much different but they can't they can't stay buried in that past they they need to move forward and they can't sort of live in this age of um well uh, in of shoujo and this age of youth so to speak um and i feel like so i feel like since it came out roughly around the same time it was speaking to a a a greater generational problem well i mean like that 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 idea is that idea has sort of come about now it sort of resurged as a result of what happened you know as a result of 311 you know the um the whole the whole idea that there is this collapsing of an endless every day and you know if we take the idea of the sh- you know if we take the idea of the shoujo's everlasting we take that everlasting element of it and we apply it to how a lot of otaku scholars whatever that means um a lot of uh, how otaku scholars are talking about it now they're still that's researched. That's coming back. You know, Fukushima is supposedly supposed to have knocked out this whole uh, endless consumption pattern. Now, whether that's actually happening or not, well, I'm not entirely sure. But, you know, these ideas do come back. Yeah, definitely. I I think the Sakaike revival is also very interesting because it's, I mean, it it's because of Fukushima that this has even happened. Possibly. So I, that's I, not I, to say that if Fukushima hadn't happened, this wouldn't... I'm sure it's something like ReZero, regardless of Fukushima, you know, could It'll be existed. interesting to see what the works are in 15 years. But I don't, I don't yeah, think your name would have been what it was if not for Fukushima. Well, your name is tied directly to Fukushima. Yeah. Like, Shinkai has said sp- specifically about the loss of the... Of the uh, Fusato, the hometown. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd, and how that is tied to catastrophe. Yeah, like I, I think it would have existed as a movie, but it wouldn't have been at all the same. Yeah, which one of you made the great line video about the uh, the convenience store shut down? It's the death of the otaku. Oh, that was us discussing it in the fucking the last podcast we did together. That's right. Yep. Yeah. The shutdown of the convenience stores. The the shutdown of the 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 great fortress of the otaku yeah um but i think we're sort of so i do want to because i feel like somebody is going to mention this in the video comments i do want to make a distinction here that what when we say that um i believe 
Sorry, I just blanked out. Never mind. I just Ignore got an that. idea for a comparative analysis between the the per, the 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 way that in Japan the convenience store symbolizes the otaku, and in America it symbolizes like uh like like lost youths like roaming um broken home people. I don't know if you've yeah, because like because uh the Green Day album American Idiot like continue like like uses the 7-eleven as like this great symbol of uh being a 17 year old from a broken home and like you spend all your time hanging out in a 7-eleven or whatever but he pre- presents it in like biblical proportions um the importance of the 7-eleven japan went through a lost youth era uh late 70s and 80s much like the united states did um the like when all the um punk shows were coming out yeah, I mean, look at the opening to Akira is a very good example of yeah. that. Is like those kids are a lost generation of kids. Yeah, yeah. Actually, they hung out in like other a, examples. They but hung that's out the in like a ruined bar, though, right? No, I, I, yeah, I know it's not necessarily yeah. convenience stores, but like they have arcade. Like there was also Japan also had the same thing. Yeah, that the United that's States did. that's kind of what I thought that great teacher teacher Onizuka was sort of addressing was like that oh, generation yeah. after they grow that's up. It. Well, she talks about it in the book, though, that there's this lost, like, uh, these millennial heroes of Samurai Champloo, yeah. Cowboy Bebop, and I said another show that I forgot, but, like, Rooney but the heroes are, like, lost, Rooney Kenshin, were like, they're lost running from their past, they don't really have a future, and they're kind of just aimlessly wandering around, and that's very much a reflect of, in Japan, I love how Brooklyn's getting really loud while I'm talking, Japan is very, you know, there's this whole generation of people who just, like, are stagnant. Yeah. And in the eighties, it was like the youth, but now it's like these youths are adults, and these adults just are just yeah waiting to die. It is. I would it say is, without uh, a doubt, the Watanabe trilogy is a deliberate, direct commentary on that. Like, yeah, those shows are about the stagnation of Japanese uh, populace. You know, I mean, Samurai Shampoo. I read that show as a screed against uh, Shikata Ganai like against the phrase mm. just the phrase itself because it comes up like if you if you pay attention to that phrase in the show like almost all of the side characters who the main three who are just wandering people who do whatever the fuck they want everyone they encounter will tell them like sh- like they're in a shitty situation and they always say like she got the gun i can't do anything you know and then the main characters will go fuck you you can't do anything and then like you know, save them and 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 lead them to these other fuller lives, doing all kinds of crazy, weird stuff. And everything in the show is themed around outsider art and hip hop. Um, and at the end, the main characters find a path uh, to you know, they or they at least come to terms with. They've put their past behind them, and they're going to move on. You know, unlike Spike, who got consumed by it. So, yeah, that's what I think that show's about. <laughs> I don't know why well, I was these, talking you know, about. <laughs> well, I mean, like, these messages, I think, are still incredibly, are possibly even more so relevant today. I mean, like, I've, I'm only a month and a half in to playing, you know, in in game time, but, like, I've been playing Persona 5, and right off the get-go, it's... Did you say a month and a half of in-game time? Do you mean... <laughs> you, yeah. you mean... you? <laughs> <laughs> a month and a half of calendar days in the game, not a month and a half of uh, the timer on your file counting up, right? No, I've been playing for a month and a half. Um, uh, I know the game's only been out in the North America for a month, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah. So calendar time. But I mean, like the whole the whole entire game is essentially about you know the inability to do things, and particularly how it affects the youth this incredibly powerless yet sort of reminiscent of Koizumi's neoliberal reform sort of Japan. It's really, it's really devastating. All right. So let's do recommendations here. So would you guys recommend this book? I would say no, if you are already entrenched in talking and thinking about anime, like there are some, there are some neat ideas in here, but I feel like they've probably been explored in more depth elsewhere. Um, and you should seek those writings. Um, or if maybe you could buy this one and any re any sentence that sounds interesting, because there's a huge 
amount of resources that she pulls from, and she lists them all, so you could just use that as, like, a buyer's guide or something. Um, but, you know, I don't know. It, it To me, it feels out of date, and, like, it doesn't say enough to be worth the effort of reading. I would not, and at the same time, recommend this book. And you cut out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I would not... And I would recommend this book at the same Cut time. Again. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why am I cutting out? Jesus Christ! I'm just gonna I'm just gonna assume Brian said no. <laughs> no, uh, Jesus. Um, Roger. Uh, I would say yes, but read at your own risk because they're like take into consideration the fact that there's definitely some stuff that isn't applicable to all anime. It's definitely it definitely dates itself in a lot of ways. But I think it can be a very good source for inspiration if, um, in order for you personally to like expand on some of these points. Because I know when I was reading that, I I was thinking, oh, and maybe I think this also could be applicable to this show, or maybe um, in some cases, um, this is what's changed um, since this book has been released. So I think it's an interesting lens into that kind of time frame. Um, in terms of criticism. So it's interesting, but you have to keep in mind, if you're going to read this, that it does indeed date itself. And that it's it's not mm-hmm. it's by no means not the most tightly put together um book we've read. Yeah, um in regards to me, I would I would say to um I would say to at least sort of understand the main idea that she's presenting which is sort of the the elegiac carnivalesque and apocalyptic but i would also warn readers to not depend on this book too much would, because it does date itself quite quite well would you say that this podcast is a suitable alternative to the book since we explained its main points and refuted the uh the problems with it i would Hmm, a suitable alternative. I don't think it will, because I think a lot of the content that we've discussed here are in relation to the book, so it can be a little alienating. Mm. I would say probably a suitable alternative would be Raina Dennison's anime, A Critical Introduction, because that is a book that is attempting to update a lot of literature that's already happened, I mean, there's a lot of... I th- I think if people want to see how people have reacted to this book, at least in a, in a lay audience lens, then yeah, sure. Why not? Why not check out this, this podcast? Yeah. Um, but honestly, for me, the gold standard of anime analysis book is something like The Anime Machine. A uh, huge thanks to uh, huge thanks to Roger for uh, coming on. You can check him out at... Uh, Roger Smith 2004. Uh, I will also post his Twitter. Uh, huge thanks to Digi for coming on. And I, I will link his channel in case if there's anybody subscribed to me who doesn't know your channel. Um, I'll also link your Twitter. Yeah. I'd, I'd say something for Brian, but he's probably just going to cut out any. And, and it does, you know, it, I realize it doesn't matter if I cut out because I'm recording myself. So, like. Anything I say that you guys can't hear is still picked up on my end, right? Yeah. Also, uh, I do do not recommend this book. <laughs> <laughs> For essentially the same reasons that Joe said, because I wrote it down in the chat, but no one reads the chat. Yes. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us on this book club. Thank you very much, uh, Digi, for coming on. No problem. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. The next book we're going to be looking at is Anne Allison's Precarious Japan. So we're going to be moving a little bit away from anime, and we're going to be looking at Japan through a very specific and a pretty pretty awesome lens. Um, and if I have it my way, we'll do like the next six books. We'll have nothing to do with anime. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's going to be very exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Um, as always, if you like the video, give it a like, subscribe. I'm going to do that, because why not? And yeah, I hope you guys enjoy your day. And peace. Gate is a Trump bad is show. Postmodern president. <laughs> oh, Gate is a bad show. <laughs> <laughs>
That's just facts. That's just facts. 